Okay, this is going to be lecture number six, and it's going to deal with a time period from about 1797 until about 1815. Uh, I'm going to discuss first a little bit about John Adams as president, the Louisiana Purchase Territory, and then the presidency of Mr. Jefferson. And then I'm going to discuss the presidency of Mr. Monroe, and I mean, Mr. Madison. And in this lecture with Madison, we'll include the War of 1812 and the Creek and Shawnee War. So this should be an interesting little lecture. Should be a couple hours in length. And all of these topics are found on your class lecture notes. And they are in very good detail in those class, those class lecture notes. So what you don't get really understand from me, you know, those lecture notes and kind of study up on them a little bit. You can understand what's going on here. And John Adams becomes president right behind Mr. Washington. Uh, Mr. Adams came in first in the election and Thomas Jefferson came in second, which means that Jefferson is Adams vice president. <clears throat> now these two men have been long, long old friends. They got along with each other ever since the Declaration of Independence in 1776. The two men have worked together in the cabinet of Mr. George Washington and both men are very familiar with each other. But during this time period, political ideologies divide these two men. Mr. Adams becomes a very dedicated Federalist. Mr. Jefferson is going to be a very dedicated Democrat Republican. And they don't see they don't see issues in the same eyes. And these two men start fussing. These two men by 1800 are political enemies of each other. They cannot stand each other. They want to be around each other. The friendship has totally fallen apart here by 1800. You know what's interesting about all this stuff is that in the 1800 election, Mr. Jefferson came in first. Mr. Adams came in second. Mr. Adams should have been the vice president for Mr. Jefferson. And he says, I'm not going to do it. I will not do it because I am not going to go back and become a vice president again if I've already been president. If I, haven't, if I can't have another four years, then I'll just go home. On inaugural day, March the 4th, 1801, Abigail and John Adams had left the White House. <clears throat> there was nobody there to greet the new president to exchange powers in this time period. Adams left, okay? Well, him and Jefferson did not have any kind of correspondence until 1812. In 1812, a mutual friend steps in and he decides to write letters to both men and then have the letters sent to the opposite direction. In other words, the letters he sent to Jefferson, and when Jefferson responded to him, the letter went to Adams. And Adams' letter would go to, would go to Ben Rush, and he would read the letter and send it on to Mr. Jefferson. So Benjamin Rush, a great physician in Philadelphia, becomes one of the major men to try to bring these two folks back together again, all right? By 1815, these two men are writing to each other directly. Mr. Adams, Mr. Jefferson are still not really keen for one another, but their letter writing does show a little bit, a little bit of depth of concern, companionship, and so forth. So they become pen pals in this time period. By 1820, the letters are very civil. The letters are really good. They are, they're questioning the future of America. They're asking all kinds of questions. They're thinking outside the box politically. The two men are doing quite well together. They will never see each other again after 1800. They will never see each other again. On July the 4th, 1826, July the 4th, 1826, our 50th birthday party, right after lunch, Jefferson dies. The moment that Jefferson dies, up in Boston, John Adams has a stroke. They put John to bed. They start preparing the body of Jefferson for burial. Around five o'clock that evening, as the sun starts going down, the sky gets that pretty pink color. John Adams rose from his bed and he says, my old enemy, Jefferson still lives. And he died. Both these men died on, on the 4th of July, 
1826, America's 50th birthday party. 50 years earlier, these two men had, had written the Declaration of Independence. And here now they are dead on July the 4th, 1826. In this an interesting conclusion here. When Jefferson died, before he died, he told his family members, do not put the presidency on my tombstone. It's the worst job that anybody could have. That no decent man wants the job is being president in the United States. It's a tough job. This is back in 1825 time period, guys. How do they feel today about being a president and all the pressure and all the turmoil and everything that goes on with being a president? Okay. So these men are already talking about how, how hard the presidency is. Washington told us how hard the presidency was in his address to the American people when he told us all goodbye. So Jefferson says, do not put the presidency on my tombstone. Put on there the father of the Declaration of Independence and put on there the founder of the University of Virginia, which he did in 1812. So Jefferson will be known for two things, University of Virginia and for the Declaration of Independence. All right, John Adams had told his son, John Quincy, who ran for president, he ran for president in 1824. I don't know why you're running for that job. That's the worst job that anybody could have. John Quincy, if I was you, I'd go to the house and forget about it. The presidency is not a job that you want to have. You've been successful as Secretary of State. You don't need to be a vice president. You don't need to be a president. And so both men saw it in the same, in the same light as being a pretty tough job to have. Okay? Now, John Adams did have a very tough presidency. He didn't have as much trouble with the British and the Spanish during this time period as he did with the French. The French did not like John Adams. The French didn't like John Adams when he's in Paris with Ben Franklin. They saw Ben Franklin as the American, and they saw John Adams as a clinger on. They didn't like John Adams. He was too puritanical. He, he was, was guilty of making comments about their culture and how they lived and so forth. He wouldn't accept the wildness of Paris, in other words. And so the Parisians did not like John Adams. And the French are the ones who really messes up Mr. Adams' presidency, okay? They really miss up Adams' presidency, and it starts down in the Caribbean. Down the Caribbean in 1797, 1797 time period, the American merchant ships are being boarded by French vessels, by French, by the French army, or the French navy, okay? War almost breaks out down here. The French started stealing soldiers. They start are stealing sailors. The French started stealing cargoes and all this stuff. And we realized, guys, we got a mess on our hands here. We got a real mess on our hands here because the French are really upsetting the trade balance and what's going on down here in the Caribbean. And remember, the Caribbean is a major trade area for the United States during the early years. And so the French give Mr. Adams all kinds of problems. We almost have a war breakout. They did have a little skirmish called, called the Quasi War down here, but a big war almost broke out between us and France. John Adams decided to send several people over to Paris to talk to them about a peace treaty, a way to solve the problem before war broke out. The American newspapers did not like this. The American newspapers believed that Mr. That Mr. Adams should declare war on France. Adams told the American people, if I declare a war on France, we'll be whooped, they'll beat us, and we'll lose our democracy. And France will take over the United States and regain the territory they had lost in the French and Indian War. That all the little things we have done since 1753 would have been done in vain. And I am not going to declare a war on France. And this made the newspapers really mad. They wrote horrible articles about John Adams and about his administration and how John Adams was a poor leader and all this kind of stuff, okay? So John Adams had to go through and battle the newspapers at the same time he's trying to deal with France, which is kind of a hard thing to do, okay? Well, he's going to send Mr. James Monroe and he's going to send Mr. John Marshall to Paris. And these two men start trying to work with the French. You also got Thomas Pinckney up in, up in London during this time period. And later on, you'll have Charles Pinckney over here in this time period. And these men try to help here solve the situation. 
When Marshall and his entourage arrived in Paris, there were three French directors. Now remember, guys, this is right in the middle of the French Revolution, okay? It's just before Napoleon Bonaparte takes over and starts leading France in a world domination campaign. He wants to conquer all of Europe in, in the early 1800s. So this is before Napoleon shows up. These three French directors, they want $300,000 a piece from the Americans just to talk to us. They want just under a million dollars just to talk to the American entourage. John Marshall sent a letter back to John Adams. Explain to him the situation that's going on in Paris. And it makes John Adams mad. Remember, we're still in Philadelphia, we're still with the Capitol. John Adams is going to go to Congress to criticize those French directors. Now remember, the minister to France lives in Philadelphia. He's part of this group. And everything that John Adams talks about or runs his mouth about or talks about is going to get back to the French directors. So instead of naming them by name, he goes for Congress and explains the situation with Mr. X, Mr. Y, and Mr. Z. And it's called the XYZ Affair. And President Adam really cuts into these guys. He talks pretty bad about these three fellows over here in Paris. And of course, that minister to France sends a letter right to those directors and told them what John Adams had said. In return, they want an apology from the president. And the president would not do it. The president said, I am not going to do this. Okay? So he comes stalemated. In early 1800, we finally have a treaty called the Treaty of Montfontaine. And in this agreement, in the, within this treaty, we are going to break ties with France. We'll still trade, but as far as being political or being allies, it's over with. So the Grand Alliance of 1778, where France joined the American Revolution, is going to fall apart in 1800. In 1800, there'll be no more dealings with the French, okay, when it, came, when it comes to being an ally or being, or being tied to them uh, militarily. It's all going to change here in this time period. So, guys, Ben Franklin, I'm sorry, uh, John Adams is going to really change the course of time. I want you guys to remember something that's very important. It's during this time period we're trying to make a deal with France about the Louisiana Purchase. Okay, it's coming open here. If John Adams had won another term as president, if he had served eight years as president, we would have never received the Louisiana Purchase Territory. The French would be damned if they would sell that territory to John Adams. Okay, if you guys remember that. When the Louisiana Purchase Territory is first announced for being for sale, Napoleon offers that to us first, tells us about it first, but the British and the Russians are very interested in that territory. And if it fell through for us, either the British or the Russians would have gained this territory. And, and uh, if it had been John Adams in charge, we'd have lost it. And it probably had gone to the Russians because they were already as far south as San Francisco on the Pacific coastline. They were, already, they were already in British Columbia and Canada and Oregon and Washington State and down toward San Francisco. They were in a position to take this territory if they wanted it, okay? So it's interesting to look at all this here in this limelight, okay? The French loved Thomas Jefferson. They loved him almost, almost as much as they, as they had loved Ben Franklin. And Thomas Jefferson realizes this, and he realizes it's to his advantage. So when the purchase comes available, he's going to jump on it with both feet. He wants it. And I'll discuss that here in a few minutes about what takes place with the Louisiana Purchase. But if John has been president, we'd have lost it. We'd have never gained it from them. We might have gained it through a war later on. We would not have gained it through the French as we did here very easily in this time period. Okay. Now, because of the threat of the French in the Caribbean, John Adams decides to create the United States Navy. The United States Navy is created by John Adams. He's the father of the United States Navy. And through Congress, he appropriates funding 
the appropriate funding to build some 30 battleships, including the USS Constitution, which is still based in Boston Harbor. Some of you guys probably seen the Constitution up here in Boston Harbor, okay? So John Adams is going to come in here, guys, and create the United States Navy. In 1800, he's going to create what is called West Point Academy. So the two big things that Mr. Adams gives the American people is a Navy and the West Point Academy, okay? Remember the army was created under George Washington, okay? Mr. Jefferson believes in a Coast Guard. So when Mr. Mr. Jefferson comes to president, you're gonna start seeing a larger, larger building for the Coast Guard. The Navy will still be in place. It will not destroy the Navy. It'll still be here. And it'll be added on to pretty regularly all the way up until the 18, 1880s, we go to an all steel Navy and we start showing the world our sea power. So the Navy is gonna be really small at first and it's gonna grow steadily over the years. As a matter of fact, in, those, in the years around the War of 1812, our Navy was made up of pirates. We hired more pirates to be our Navy than the United States Navy. So don't you guys remember that one also? That's kind of an interesting little situation to, to consider here. Um, in this time period, okay? Now, during this big squabble over France, we had a disease come in, a pandemic, if you will. We do not know knows what causes this, and the, and the disease was yellow fever. A lot of people believe the French had sent over war, over germ warfare, and was attacking American people. Mr. Adams is convinced that immigrants have come into the country who are, who are un-American. And these immigrants are the ones who are causing the problem. He, they're the ones who are causing the problem. So he's going to pass or have Congress pass what is called the Alien Act. The Alien Act goes against newly arrived immigrants. And under the Alien Act, in order to become American citizen, you must live here for 14 years. It takes 14 years to gain citizenship. Under the Constitution, it would take seven and he doubled it. Now, if you're a newly arrived immigrant and you talk ill toward the president or toward the Navy or toward the army or toward Congress, you can be arrested and go to prison, okay? You can be arrested and go to prison. And so guys, this Alien Act was very serious in this time period. And then they passed what is called the Sedition Act. The Sedition Act goes against the newspapers. It's going to interfere with free speech, is what it's going to interfere with. So you have what is called the Alien and Sedition Acts here in this time period under John Adams. Okay, the Federalists are the ones who pass these two acts through Congress. One of the first things that will happen with under Mr. Jefferson is that these acts will be repealed. Okay, now several of your states did not want to accept these two acts. They saw them as being unconstitutional. And these two states were Kentucky and Virginia. And you have what is called the Kentucky Virginia Revolution, a resolution, I'm sorry, the Kentucky and Virginia Resolution. And they said they would not accept these two acts, that they're gonna nullify this federal law. In other words, they will not agree to it. They will not, they will not be enforcing this act, okay? So guys, you got a real interesting situation going on here. All right, when these two states refuse to accept federal law and they try to nullify it. Nullifying means they will not accept it. They will not enforce this in their states. Well guys, John Marshall of the Supreme Court will solve this problem in 1801. They'll bring the Alien Sedition Act before, before the Supreme Court. It'll come in the way of a court case called Mulberry versus Madison. Mr. Mulberry was a, was a judge, a Federalist judge that Mr. Adams put into place to kind of hamper anything that Jefferson wanted to do politically. He put several dozen of these judges in at one time, just before he left office. These are called midnight judges. And the whole idea is to mess up the future president. Sound familiar? Anything you can do to mess with future future president, you're gonna do it, okay? And it all started with John Adams bickering with, with Mr. Jefferson. 
Well, Mulberry and his bunch all got fired. As soon as Mr. Mr. Jefferson took office, these midnight judges were all fired and they sued to get their jobs back. And when the leader, when the leading lawyers, of course, was Mr. Mulberry. So the court case was called Mulberry versus Madison. Mr. Madison was your attorney general during this time period. Okay, Supreme Court ruled. Mr. Marshall says that states cannot nullify federal laws. Supreme Court has the power to find laws unconstitutional. Mr. Mr. Marshall says that all the states should have the same federal laws. They should all have the same federal laws. And that way the American people will be protected to the Supreme Court. What you're seeing here, guys, is a new three-way balance of power. Whatever the House and the Senate wants to do and they pass a law on it, it goes to the President. The President can either accept it or he can veto it. If the President does not veto it and accepts it, the Supreme Court can review it. And the, and the Supreme Court could find it unconstitutional, which vetoes that law. So now you've got three-way balance of power here in the United States. That's why you want to make sure, guys, the Supreme Court does not become politically motivated. The Supreme Court should not have anything to do with politics. They're there to serve the American people as a group, not as a political body. Washington warned us of this. Keep the Supreme Court the way it is, so it go through and have, make, good, make good, clear judgments that are not political judgments. Okay? So Mr. Marshall is the father of the American Supreme Court. He tells the American people he has the power to find federal law constitutional or unconstitutional. They should go to the Supreme Court to do all this stuff. Okay, so guys, what it boils down to is the Alien Act goes against newly arrived immigrants. The Sedition Act goes against newspapers. Okay, and y'all remember that. And Mr. Mr. Adams has a hard four years with all this turmoil going on in this time period, okay? Well, guys, Mr. Adams runs re-election in 1800. He's the first president to ever live in the White House, but he lost the election. He came in second. The 1800 election was so close that the House of Representatives had to decide who won the election. And of course, it went to Thomas Jefferson, John Adams becomes your vice president. He refused to take the office. And so Aaron Burr becomes your new vice president. He was a third runner up during this time period. Okay.
So guys, what happens here is John Adams has got some major problems to deal with. And John Adams realizes his presidency was not a very good presidency. And he decides to just go home. He does not stay around for Mr. Jefferson to come in to take over. Now we call this guys, the election of Thomas Jefferson, a political revolution because the parties changed. We went from a, par from a party of the Federalists running the country with Washington and Mr. Adams. And now we're going to the Democratic Republicans. Remember that Mr. Jefferson believed that the middle class should rule America where the wealthier class should rule under the Federalist. So now you'll see more power going into the hands of the American people than ever before because he believes in educated yeoman farmers that these are the most, the most vocal bunch of people in America and that they could actually run the country better than the wealthy class because they knew what was going on in the local areas. Remember, guys, something about all this. In America, the wealthier class have always been segregated from the rest of the American people. They're, they are segregationists. They are not then with, Amer with the American people. They have taken themselves out of American society and created their own society among themselves. So they are totally segregated from the American people. And it's still that way. The wealthy class has no concern. They have no idea what it's like in America for the poor or the middle class. And they do not care. As long as they're in power and they are in political power, they don't worry about it. Okay. They totally do not see the way, they don't see life in the way that a normal American sees life because they're way above it because they have so much money, they can, they can totally avoid the American people. So Mr. Jefferson pretty much flips all of this in this time period, okay? And of course, later on, Mr. Jackson will say that he's here for the common person. He's here for the common man, as he called it during this time period. So you see this shift where the American people are trying to become more involved in the political sphere than the wealthier class, okay? Of course, the wealthier class are still trying to hang on as much as, very, as much they possibly can uh, during this time period, okay? Mr. Mr., um, Mr. Jefferson comes in and he is going to have some major issues to deal with, particularly when it comes to the French. When the French announced in 1803, that the land West Mississippi River system is available for occupation, we want it. We tried earlier to purchase the city of New Orleans when the Spanish still had it, okay? When the Spanish had New Orleans and were trying to close it down, we offered Spain $15 million for New Orleans and for part of the Southeast or for part of the South here of the country. And of course they turned us down. In 1801, Napoleon attacked Spain during his Napoleonic Wars, and Spain was defeated pretty quickly. And Napoleon told Spain that they must provide him with money to pay for his war. Well, God, Spain had no money. All the money they made off the New World, they done squandered it. They had no money left. And Napoleon says, you have got land in North America, that was once was mine, was once French land, and y'all had it ever since the French and Indian War, and so therefore we want it back. So Spain gave France the Louisiana Purchase Territory as a payment to help Napoleon fight this war. Napoleon decided to sell this land as quickly as possible to have the financing to go ahead and attack Belgium and Luxembourg, attack Germany, and try to get most of Western Europe as quickly as he possibly could. He's gonna have as far as far as far west as Russia uh, in these Napoleonic Wars. So the, the news is on the streets in 1803, Napoleon wants to sell this property in North America. It runs from New Orleans out to the Rocky Mountains and on up into British or on into uh, Alberta, Canada. It's gonna be the middle part of the country. It includes the states of North Dakota. South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri. It'll go on down to Arkansas, Louisiana. It'll be Oklahoma and Kansas. It'll be Colorado. It'll be Nebraska. And it'll be Montana and Wyoming. Okay? So this is part, this is part of the Louisiana Purchase Territory out here. It's a big hunk of land out here. 
Napoleon offers this land to the Americans. He tells the, the ministers in, in France the land is for sale. They in return send letters to Mr. Jefferson. Jefferson reviewed all of this and what the possibility of all of this was, and he decided just to purchase it. Without going to Congress, without even going to Congress, he's gonna purchase this land. And how does he pay for this land? He uses a bank that was established by Alexander Hamilton, okay? The bank that he fought against to get Washington DC is a bank he uses to finance this big land purchase. When it's all said and done, this land purchase is gonna be $15 million. $15 million, all right? Our library on main campus costs more than $15 million. The Cali Art Center costs more than $15 million. You get, you get a perspective here of what a land deal this is gonna be. When it's all said and done, this property is gonna sell for three cents an acre. Three cents an acre. That's a big, huge land purchase, guys. It's a great deal on this land purchase. Jefferson also realizes the Constitution does not discuss land purchases. It does not discuss land purchases. So therefore, he feels as if he can do anything he wants to here. He cannot be held accountable one way or the other because the Constitution does not discuss land purchases. It discusses new territories, but that's existing, that's existing territory. That's existing land we already have. But a land purchase is a big deal here. So he just bought it. He just bought it. Well, that really upset Congress. They didn't like this at all of him doing this around their back. They thought he extended his power. Some people call for the impeachment of Jefferson for doing this. But in the meantime, he hatched another plan up. He got special appropriations through Congress, secretly, not telling the whole facts, that allowed him to get Meriwether Lewis, his personal, his personal secretary there in the White House, who in return chose William Clark to go with him to explore this new frontier, this new territory. Now, Meriwether Lewis had some mental issues uh, it was called melancholy during this time period. Melancholy was one day you're up, one day you're down. Um, you are bipolar maybe. Uh, it could be um, that you are, have, a, have a mild case of depression or, or, or even a serious case of depression. And Jefferson figured that if he sent Meriwether Lewis on this mission, that it might help to kill him. It might be a good tonic for him to go on. Well, he sends Meriwether Lewis. Mr. Lewis contacts his best friend, Mr. William Clark, and they meet together in Philadelphia. They meet with Benjamin Rush. Benjamin Rush is one of the most, one of the most famous surgeons of the time period, and Ben Rush is a founding father. And Benjamin Rush is going to train these boys, these two young men, and how to taxidermy, how to go through and take samples, how to go through and, and dry out flowers, how to go through and press flowers and so forth and weeds and various kinds of plants because their mission is a scientific mission that's being headed by a great scientist whose name is Thomas Jefferson. Yes, he believed in science. He wanted to explore and find out what is out there scientifically. Okay, so these two men are going to go to St. Louis, Missouri Waiting in St. Louis will be about 45 army boys. These young men have volunteered for this mission. They got a kill boat with them. A kill boat looks like a regular boat. It's got a sail in the middle of it, okay? It's pretty, it could be a pretty good sized boat. This, one, this boat was probably about 40 feet long, probably about 20 feet across. And it was not real, real deep hole because the Missouri River is not very deep. Like the Mississippi is not very deep. They just drainage rivers, okay? Also in St. Louis, Lewis and Clark are going to choose some 32 young men to go with them across the country. These are your equivalents of modern day astronauts. These 32 men they choose have been our frontiersmen. They've been all over this territory. They've been as far as far west as Idaho. A lot of these guys are Canadian. They are have French Canadian uh, lineage because their parents had moved into this territory once the French and Indian War had ended. 
and these boys grew up out here, and a lot of these young men knew the native languages. They knew the native languages, okay? They also carried artists with them to draw the landscape. Both Lewis and Clark will keep a journal, okay? Now, Mr. Clark has another job that's very important. He's going to draw a map of the new region. Mr. Clark is your map maker. You know, he started off in St. Louis, Missouri. They went, the, they went, the, the, uh, they went up the Missouri River, River from St. Louis, or north of St. Louis, got into the Mandan people by Christmas, or by, by December of 1804. They were in the Mandan people up in North Dakota where it's freezing cold up here. It's like minus 40, it's awful up here. The Mandan people lived underground. The Mandan people had their village underground because it's so cold up there, they had to exist underground, all right? Then they're gonna leave the Mandan people and go across what is now Montana and Wyoming. When they get into, when they get into Great Falls, Montana, they're gonna realize the river is getting small. They come to a large waterfall, five cascades of the, of the Missouri River, and they're forced to walk around it. They had to pull their canoes around all of this stuff to get into, to get back into the Missouri River again. As a matter of fact, they pull the canoes some 17 miles around the falls. That's like pulling from Crestview to Nyseville. That's pretty good. Well, that'd be a pretty good stretch of land to pull a canoe, to pull canoes across and then fully load it. Once they got into this area here of Idaho, they're going to find the Shahoni people. One of their people with them was a young Indian lady, and she is going to find her people. She was captured by the Mandan, enslaved, and then gained her freedom. So, so Gagawea is going to be with them here, guys, on this trip going across the country. And here, she's going to find her people, and they will help them with horses to get across all Idaho and into what is now Washington State. And they'll soon find the Columbia River. And by the, by, by the late fall of 1805, they are on, on the Pacific coastline. They're the first Americans to go across the entire country. And by the way, Spain knew they were out there. Spain spied on them. Spain was concerned about this land going on out here and who could take it over. And they're not real happy about all this because Spain believed their land was their land and nobody could take it away from them. Okay? So guys, they go over to, to the, to the Oregon Pacific Ocean. They come back home in, in 1806 and they're national heroes here. But what's really important about this trip is Clark's map. Clark's map was GPS in the early 1990s. His handwritten map is 45 miles off. That's pretty good. It's a pretty good map maker here in this time period. If you go to the lecture notes, I've got a complete articles that deal with the crossing of the, of the America, uh, North America by Lewis and Clark and their group. There's also a film, a very good film on the Facebook page and also on the lecture, the lecture video page. All right. And uh, y'all need to watch this. I think you'll get a, a, a kick. They got college boys to go through and recreate the trip here, guys, across North America. It's a very interesting film to watch. Eddie Bauer put it together. And it's a very interesting film. I think you guys will really be watching it. And so I would li I'd like for you guys to get a chance to watch that film uh, in class. Luke, come here. What are you barking at? You be quiet. You watch TV and be quiet. My little Luke, my little hound dog, Lab won't bark all morning. All right. So you behave, Luke. All right. So, guys, Lewis and Clark was a great success. We realized the land out here could be occupied, that people could live out here and survive. You know, the old timers thought this area was full of dinosaurs. They had poisonous mountains and all kinds of evil, a wicked witch out here, if you, if you will. And they said, well, America, we never go across the Mississippi River system, that the West was totally off the, off, the, off the boundary markers for the future of America. And of course, we go in here, guys, and we do find some El Dorados. We find the oil. We're going to find the big, huge agricultural fields that'll grow plenty, plenty of corn and wheat. We're going to find all kinds of, of precious minerals out here. There'll be some land rushes out here. Maybe the next big land rush will be in Arkansas. 
or, or I should not say land rush, but the next big gold rush will be in Arkansas during this time period. So we're going to find several Colorados out here with Lewis and Clark going across the country. And so Mr. Mr. Jefferson is well pleased with all of this. He's very pleased. He got he got away with it, guys. Getting this land for 15 or getting this land for three cents an acre. And the American people realize that this land can be used agriculturally. And of course, people start flooding out here once John Deere invents his steel plow in the mid 1830s. Steel plows can plow at this prairie land. And when this happens, people are going to start flocking into Kansas and Nebraska and Idaho, Iowa and so forth to claim this land uh, as their own. And we'll discuss that also later on in class about these land grants and these land purchases that were allowed for the American people to, uh, to enjoy here during this time period, okay? Mr. Jefferson also had another problem. In 1801, an American, American merchant ships were being attacked off the coast of Africa. They're in the Mediterranean Sea. And I told you before how dangerous this sea was for piracy going way back to Prince Henry the Navigator. Well, American merchant vessels going to Italy and going into other areas of, of this part of the world, North Africa, into Spain, even into Portugal, were being attacked by a bunch of pirates who based themselves in Libya. These pirates were called the Barbary Pirates. The Barbary Pirates off the Barbary Coast. Jefferson got tired of it. In 1801, he's going to send a naval vessel called the USS Philadelphia out here to take care of these pirates. Remember, guys, he does not want a Navy, but yet he's going to use the Navy to go out here against these pirates. You see what's happening, guys? He used the national banking system, now uses the, uses the United States Navy. Two things he's totally against when you come, when you come become president everything's on the table. So what they promise you might not be fulfilled in those campaign promises because they might find other ways or other alternatives to try to solve a problem than what you think they will. So President Jefferson sends the Philadelphia out here to take down these Barbary pirates off the coast of North Africa. Okay? Well, this boat, our ship, comes into a little place called Tripoli. This is where the pirates were based. And these pirates saw the American vessel coming and they got out in front of the vessel for to chase them. Yeah, we're shooting off pistols and rifles and we're shooting off cannons and all this stuff. We're trying to chase down, chase down these pirates. Stupid thing to do. Admiral Bainbridge was not paying attention, guys. And those pirates led our boat right into a sandbar. And we're going full sail. And we hit that sandbar and we skidded across it. And the boat sunk right in the middle of that sandbar. It got stuck. It could not get out. You had water up to almost to the top of the, the sides of the bows of the boat. It's stuck. There's no tow boats out here in this time period. There's no way to get this boat out. Admiral Bainbridge said, well, I'll wait till high tide. It was high tide. He's stuck. And these pirates are going to come rowing out here, and they take 248 Americans as hostage. Here's our first international hostage crisis. And they take these boys, these sailors, to the backside of Tripoli, and they have them in a holding area, a secret holding place. Jefferson knew if he sent the Navy out with four or five ships, he could destroy the, the Barbary pirates, but he also would probably kill the American sailors in doing so. So he tried diplomacy. He calls Charles Pinckney in from London. He goes to Paris. He's in here with Robert Livingston and with Mr. Monroe. They're trying to do two jobs at one time here, guys. They're trying to get the Louisiana Purchase sealed up. They're trying to deal with these Barbary pirates here at the same time period. These men have their hands full here in Paris. After talking to groups who knew groups who knew groups, the United States finally finds out where these men are being held. We get a map. 
We have everything we need here, guys, for an invasion to bring our sailors back. So we put together a large group of Marines and Navy men, put them on a, on a United States battleship, and we sail right back to Tripoli Harbor. We arrive in the middle of the night. And the first thing the United States Navy does is they shell the Philadelphia. The Philadelphia is going to catch on fire and burn down to the water line. This gives you the diversion to go behind and capture our men. Because everybody in the city are going to head to the seashore to see what's going on. The leader of the group will be, will be Lieutenant Stephen Decatur. And they're going to take rowboats off the mothership and row in on the outskirts of Tripoli, hide their boats here, turn them over, they won't float back out in the sea. And they go around and they capture, how they recapture all the American sailors. These boys will come back to the shore, reboard those, those uh, rowboats, row into the bay there at Tripoli, and the mothership picks, picks them all back up and she sails away. We have, we, have, we have truly done a remarkable job here in regaining our soldiers, regaining our sailors here. The American people were very, were very proud of all this stuff and what took place here. So guys, Mr. Jefferson had a very successful first four years. He put down the Barbary Pirates. He got the Louisiana Purchase Territory going on. The Supreme Court comes in here, gets all the gets all the, all the federal judges that Mr. Adams put into place. Here comes here comes a, a judicial review by, by the by the Supreme Court. A lot of good things happened here in this time period. All right, in 1804, however, here comes trouble. In 1804, your vice president decided the vice presidency was a horrible job to have, and he wanted to go back to New York State and run for governor. His name is Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr goes back to New York State to run for the governorship of New York. Now, Mr. Burr is pretty hot-headed. He's very determined. He sees things the way he wants to see things. It's hard to make him change his mind on certain issues. And he has a major problem because of it. He goes back up here, guys, and a lot of folks do not want to see Aaron Burr as their governor. And one of these folks is Alexander Hamilton. And Mr. Hamilton becomes very vocal in how he feels about Mr. Burr. And he says some things that makes Mr. Burr extremely angry. And he considered these items to be insulting and belittling. If you go through and belittle a man, criticize a man in public in a severe way, this man can seek revenge. And during American, early American history, that revenge of somebody bad-mouthing you was called a duel. Dueling was legal across the country except for one state, New York. New York State had outlawed dueling because a very prominent New York family had a 23-year-old son who died in a duel. And this family is going to go to Albany, and the state legislators in Albany outlawed dueling in New York State. The young man killed was named, was named Peter Hamilton, the son of Alexander Hamilton. And Mr. Hamilton made Mr. Burr so mad that Mr. Burr called him out on the duel. You can't duel in New York State. So they, they agreed to duel over in New Jersey. Go across the Hudson River. The dueling was often done early in the mornings, kind of out of the mind of folks who are still inside, you know, getting ready for the day, still sleeping, eating, that sort of thing. And so these two men agreed to go across the Hudson River to New Jersey for the duel. Both men will have their own groups who go with them. So there'll be witnesses on both sides. Okay? Well, guys, on July the 11th, 1804, at sunrise, boats hit the water on the, on the Manhattan side and made their way across to New Jersey. 
uh, one group in one group was a Hamilton bunch and the other group was the Burr bunch. And then you had the dual master, the man who oversaw the duel with his apprentice. They climbed the banks there along the, along the river and made their way to a grassy knoll up here in New Jersey. And here the dual master gave the instructions. There'll be a coin toss. Whoever won the coin toss had the first choice at the, at the dueling pistols. Okay, the dueling pistols were contained in a box. Usually a, usually a, a, a mahogany box that is lined with either felt or silk or some kind of nice material. Each gun had one shot, so one shot pistol. It had to have the bullet, it had to have the, the shot dropped in, the gunpowder packed in, and it goes through and cock it before you handed the gun. If you let that gun go off and you're still holding up like that gun goes off, that is your first shot. Your competitor can shoot right into you with no problem because you done shot you, you done shot your load too early. All right. So guys, what's happening? Is Luke, hush. What happens here, guys, is that this dueling master had the two men flip a coin. They chose head or tails. The winner was the one who got the first shot at the guns. He could hold both pistols, choose the one that felt best in his hands, and so forth. And then the other gun would go to the other gun. Now, in between all this, the, the, the young kid is going to load the pistols, okay? They're going to load the pistols, all right? So they put these two men, Hamilton and Burr, back to back. They're told to, 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 walk, to walk off 10 paces and turn and shoot. Mr. Hamilton turned first. He took his pistol and aimed it toward the, toward the face of Mr. Burr and then pulled the gun to the side and fired. He totally missed Mr. Burr on purpose. I will not kill you. I will show you I'm man enough to fight against you, but this outcome is totally ridiculous. Mr. Burr saw it a totally different way. He aimed his pistol right toward the chest plate of Mr. Mr. Hamilton, and he fired the shot. And Burr's bullet went into his rib cage. It broke into the ribs and splintered into his lungs. Mr. Mr. Hamilton is mortally wounded. They take Mr. Hamilton back across the river where the next day he died from his gunshot wounds. And when he died, the men with Hamilton and part of the men with Mr. Burr said Mr. Burr did it on purpose. That Mr. Burr actually murdered, actually murdered Mr. Hamilton. All right. Now, Mr. Burr thought he could get off with this. I'm a well-known New York lawyer. I have a lot of influence here in the city of New York, New York, New York. I can stand in the middle of Wall Street and kill somebody, not be arrested for it. That attitude. All right. Mr. Burr is going to be in trouble. The court is going to draft papers to arrest him. And he's going to flee. Mr. Burr goes off running. He boards a boat and he starts sailing southward. And he ends up in Pensacola, Florida. And Pensacola, Florida. Mr. Burr tells the, the, the authorities in, in, in Pensacola, the Spanish authority, that he wants to create a large army to make war with the United States. That his plan is to go through and have the Spanish join up with him to furnish him with supplies and a, and a naval fleet. That he was going to go to New Orleans and see former gen or see General um, uh, what was his name? Oh, shoot, David. General Wilkerson, get his name right here, Mr. James Wilkerson, and have him put together militia in New Orleans while he goes up to the whiskey country where the whiskey rebellions are all living from the 1794 time period and have them join his army. He's planning to have the Spanish recruited become his ally. As soon as he talked to the Spanish, he's going to sail to New Orleans, where he sees John James Wilkerson. And here, Mr. Wilkerson understands the complete plan of Mr. Burr. Mr. Wilkerson is the territorial governor of the South Louisiana Purchase Territory. He is the general in charge of, or the governor in charge of, the South Louisiana 
purchase territory, which includes Louisiana and Arkansas. Okay, that's, that's part of his deal. The governor in charge of the Northern Louisiana Purchase Territory will be William Clark. And William Clark will be in charge of Missouri and on up northward for mayor. Okay, so guys, he goes and sees Mr. Wilkerson. Then he goes to Natchez, he gets on the Natchez Trace and goes all the way to Nashville, Tennessee. From Nashville, Tennessee, he goes up into the Cumberland River and makes his way on up into the Ohio River where he starts recruiting these whiskey men to join his army. This is the vice president, a former vice president doing all this stuff. And they're gonna to put together a large army and Mr. Burr is going to go to uh, Cincinnati. Cincinnati is well known for boat making. As a matter of fact, by, by 1810, Robert Fulton and his bunch are building river boats out here in the areas of Cincinnati, Ohio. So this is going to be well known for the early transportation of, of steamboats and vessels here from the 1810 time period. And here, Mr. Burr is going to have an elaborate houseboat put together for him. Yeah, yacht. And he's going to sail down the river back to Natchez. His army of some 4,000 men are going to march, are going to walk down the trace back to Nashville, to back to Nashville and on down to Natchez. So Mr. Burr is floating in style, his men are walking, they're hoofing it, and he's laying up there like Cleopatra on the Nile. Mr. Burr does not realize this, but Mr. Wilkerson did not like what he had to say. Wilkerson sat down, wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson and told him the plans of Aaron Burr. And Mr. Jefferson is going to send federal troops to Natchez to arrest Aaron Burr. When he arrives in Natchez on that big, huge boat, that big yacht of his, he's going to be arrested and charged with treason. He'll go before the John Marshall Court under this charge of treason. Several weeks later, all these men come marching into Natchez from the north. The army's going to round them up and tell these guys got a choice, either go to federal prison or sign a loyalty oath. Most of these men signed a loyalty oath and went right back home. Mr. Burr was charged for murder and for, and for treason. Well, when it came time for the court, the court date, hush. When it came down for the, to the court date, Mr. Burr will have an ally with you. The ally will be Thomas Jefferson. John Marshall wants the president to testify against Mr. Burr. And Mr. Jefferson has the letter from Mr. Wilkerson. Of course, he's there also. And Mr. Mr. Jefferson refused to go to court. He told John Marshall that he had executive privilege. Executive privilege is what kept him from having to go to court to testify against his, against his vice president, his former vice president, Mr. Aaron Burr. And Burr gets off. He gets off the treason charge, but he's still being charged for murder in New York. A bunch of his friends are going to sneak him off up to Baltimore. He boards the boat and he sails out to France, to France. He'll be in France until the end of the War of 1812. The Setchel's limitation is for seven years. So he's going to be gone for over seven years. When he comes back home, he'll find his political career and his personal lawyer career pretty well shot. It will take him several years to reestablish his law firm. And not much as has ever heard from Aaron Burr. When Aaron Burr turns 84 years old, his wife will sue him for a divorce. And that will be in the New York newspapers. All right. And in the, and in the charges for divorce, she has found him with another woman. He is having relations with another woman at age 84. And they divorce. So Aaron Burr is quite the character to look at here. Okay, and for more detail and more information on all of this, you can go read the lecture notes. I got full, full, uh, a full lecture here on Aaron Burr and what he was up here during this time period. Okay, all right, and then of course we're going to have major problems with England again, starting in 1806. In 1806, England again starts impressing our sailors. They start sending cargoes on the high sea. They are violating the John Jay Treaty. 
They're violating the Adams Treaty. And Miss Jefferson must ponder what to do. Do I make war against England or do I try to find a peaceful solution to the problems in England? And Mr. Ad Mr. Jefferson decides that he is going to try the peace route. And he's going to send ministers over to, over to England trying to find a peaceful solution of all of this. Nothing works out. In 1807, he's going to declare that no American vessel can go to Europe to any European country for trade. He cuts off the trade to Europe on all American shipping. Now, he does allow the Caribbean. The Caribbean connection is still very important in American history, guys. But as far as us going to England or France or any other country where our boys could be, could be held prisoner, could, could be captured and our cargo stolen, and plus, going to the Caribbean, the American Navy has got close to 35 ships now. It's a little bit easier to patrol that region if you just go to certain islands. You sail down the coast of Florida, you have the Coast Guard that's going to be with you to a certain extent. Okay? So, Mr. Jefferson is trying to find a way out. Guys, this causes some major economic problems for New England. When their ships cannot go to England and trade, they lose over $120 million in freight loss. They lose money. They've also been losing sailors up here in the same time period. But the people of New England go into a recession because of this Embargo Act of 1808. On the first day of January 1808, no ships are allowed to go to the European continent. It's going to cause major problems. In the same breath, guys, the African slave trade is going to come to an end in, in January of 1808. It is now illegal to, to transport slaves from Africa directly back to the United States. Of course, you don't see them smuggling people back until the 18, late 1850s, but it's illegal to transport people from Africa directly to the United States. Okay? The American people do not like what Jefferson has done about the trade. And remember, guys, it's the import tax, the custom duties that pays for the federal government. You got $15 million owed to the Bank of the United States to pay for a Louisiana purchase. So it all starts kind of going downhill here with Thomas Jefferson. His first four years were wonderful. His last four years were pitiful. By the time he leaves office, he's lost weight. He has migraine headaches. He's aged immensely, and he's ready to go home. He pretty much handpicks the man who will take his place. He'll be a distant cousin whose name is Mr. James Madison. Mr. Madison will take over as president on March the 4th, 1809. And Mr. Madison is going to first repeal the Embargo Acts. And he has what is called the Maconis Bill, it's spelled M-A-C-O-N-I-S, Maconis Bill, to try to bring back new relations with Great Britain. And England agrees to stop all the aggression on the high seas and to stop dealing with Indian folks in the Ohio Valley. The same thing that John Jay had dealt with, we're dealing with again here, guys, in 1809. The same mess. The same thing. England is still belittling us, and England knows that we do not have the will to fight because we want to try diplomacy. We know if we fight against the country, we could lose our country. So we decided diplomacy was our best policy. Okay. So y'all kind of remember all of this interesting items here in this time period. Presidents have lots of troubles to deal with starting here, okay? By the way, Thomas Jefferson begins a new group of presidents. There'll be three of them. It'll be Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Madison, and Mr. Monroe. These three men are from Virginia, and they are called the Virginia Dynasty. The Virginia Dynasty presidents are Mr. Jefferson, 1801 to 1809. Mr. 
Madison, 1809 to 1817. Mr. Monroe from 1817 to 1825. And those are your Virginia Dynasty presidents here in this time period, okay? Now, in 1811, just a few, just a few months after this big McConnell's bill, Britain begins to violate this bill again. And a new non-importation tax or act is passed by Congress, trying to limit the troubles with England, okay? But here comes the real problem. In the middle part of the country, in Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, what we come Mississippi and Alabama, you have a large Indian group here, the Shawnee, the Cherokees, and the Creeks. And these Indians are concerned about their future because the American squatters are heading their way. They're being infiltrated immensely here. You see, guys, once Lewis and Clark came back home, the United States Congress appropriated money to build highways westward. The National Highway is going to leave Philadelphia and go to St. Louis. The National Highway goes right through Shawnee territory. And Augusta, Georgia, the old wagon road, road ended from Philadelphia. They're going to start a federal road that runs out toward Atlanta, down toward Montgomery, and down toward Mobile. Today, there's Interstate 40, Interstate, six, Interstate 85, and Interstate 65. This road is called the Federal Road. The Federal Road goes from Augusta out toward Stone Mountain and down toward Montgomery and on down toward Mobile. I could get you guys on a bus and be on the old Federal Road in about an hour and 15 minutes from here. Is that how side close by? It's on the other side, on the other side of Monroe, Alabama. Monroe's 100 miles up to Monroe. And we can be there in a short period of time and I can take y'all right to that old Federal Road up there. I've been on it many a time. Been on to all those old country stores along that road. Very interesting place to go visit, go see here, to learn some local history, okay? But the Federal Road is still in existence today. It runs, it runs parallel to Interstate 65, okay? The road is gonna end at Fort Stoddard. That's north of Mobile. They didn't come down through the, through the swamps of Mobile to build a road, guys. They got to a place to get boats and go to Mobile by boat. And then the road is gonna turn and go out toward Natchez. It's called the Three Notch Road going out toward Natchez. You see, every mile on a pine tree, they put three notches with an ax. That's why it's called Three Notch Road. If you're traveling at night, you look for your mile markers, the three notches on that pine tree, and you know you're still on the right road. When the road gets up towards Slidell, or out toward the areas of Hattiesburg, I should say, then you go southward and head down to New Orleans and use a boat to get into the city of New Orleans from Slidell or from Lake Pontchartrain at Covington. So there's ways to get into New Orleans by boat. There's ways to get New Orleans to New Mobile by boat. The roads are how much are pretty much on the highland. They're not in the swampy areas on the highlands here. So a lot of Highway 84 is the old is the old road to Natchez, the old Three Notch Road. When you guys travel these roads, y'all realize the history behind these highways. And along these roads, you'll, you'll see historical markers that are placed. And you can stop and read these historical markers and see what took place at Gosport, Alabama, or what took place at, at Waynesboro, Mississippi, or, in, or over in um, uh, Brookhaven, Mississippi. You can follow all these old trails by these, by these old historical markers that are put up in the 1930s by the Depression people. The historians did all this to, to get a job. Right now, the local history, put them on a road sign and put them on the side of the road somewhere. All right, interesting way to do all this stuff. Okay, so guys, they build these roads through here. Well, the first thing that happens is all these white settlers with white supremacy ideologies behind them, but they're better off these Indian folks are. And this land should be their land, not the Indian land. And these folks begin to squat on the land. I read a story about a little Indian boy named Sonota. He lived just north of, uh, he lived just north of Baymanette up there on the Federal Highway, up there in Monroe County. And one afternoon, a bunch, bunch of white folks came in and slaughtered his whole family. They slaughtered his family and they took over the plantation. They took over the household here. Little Sonota's about seven years old, maybe eight years old. 
this little Indian boy just barely escaped with his life. And he went running down to the cane patches, down to the cane, the cane areas to hide and made his way to Baldwin County. Came to a household that's owned by the McGrath family, Zechariah and, and Nancy McGrath. The wife went out to the smokehouse to get some bacon for the evening meal. She heard a little child behind the smokehouse in a thicket that was crying. When you go to a thicket that's got briars in there, got, you know, got all those old vines and mess all tangled up. You guys have been squirrel hunting, you know what I'm talking about? And she made her way to those vines and found that little child back there. Naked, bleeding, extremely distressed. And she pulled that little boy out of that thicket and brought him to the house and gave him a bath. And she clothed him and she loved on him and she talked to him and got him settled down. And he told her, told him, or he told her the story. And she says, Sonota, you're now my son. Jesus sent you to me and I'm your new mama. And I'm gonna take good care of you. I'm gonna love on you. And my three daughters will see you as a little brother. And you you got a great place to come to. Okay. Down on the Florida Alabama border, Ben Hawkins, the Indian agent that George Washington appointed to come to the South to train the Creek Indians how to become good farmers. And they were good farmers, by the way. That family, the Sonotas family, were agricultural people. They had their crops and they did well for themselves. But these white people believed the land should be theirs and Indians had no right on the land because they were not even human. They had deemed them to be, they had deemed them to be soulless. You find someone who's soulless, you can do anything you want to to them. So not only stole the land and the house of Sonoda's family, also stole the crops that they had ready to be harvested here shortly. Ruin that little boy's life. Down on the border was, was was David Tate, William Weatherford, and then Dan Hawkins. Hey. Hold on a second. You get in there, you hush. Go on. Got the streets, streets people going out here. You can't stand the street sweeper. Ben Hawkins, William Weatherford, and David Tate. Yeah, you go there and lay down. You better mind me. Ben Hawkins, David Tate, and William Westford down here on the on the border of Florida, Alabama, marking the state line or marking the territorial line between the two countries. What they did was they put a pile of sand up every mile. The mile marker was piles of sand. And these sand piles were close to six feet tall. Several years ago, Troy University came down along the, along the Florida, Georgia, I mean the Florida, Alabama border, and they discovered these sand mounds. They're still here. They're only about, well, some were four feet high. A lot of them were like two or three feet high. They had to go through distinguish between a, a, a red, a, a red ant hill, a fire ant hill, and, and the actual border markers here. And while they were down here, they learned of a pedophile in Alabama who was raping Indian children, little boys and little girls. And these men left their job and went into the areas north of us and found this gentleman. He was, he was, he was actually a German immigrant who had come in through Georgia, making his way probably to Texas. And this man was captured. They called him red-handed. And they took him and they disemboweled him. They disemboweled him. They took care of him right there on the spot. They knew how to deal with pedophiles. On days of the day, the law would not allow this happen today. But that was the way they took care of trouble in the past. When you start reading history, you'll realize a lot of your problems today were, were in that time period also, that people either denied it, they didn't do a thing about it, or the Vigilantes Committee, which was a, which was a public police force, okay? They were trying to make change happen themselves, usually a minister headed up the Vigilantes Committee, 
the mindset of the committee is going to go to the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan has that same mindset here. And they took care of people like this. If you beat your wife or, or hurt your children or was just generally had a crazy attitude toward people and way you conducted your life, they'd come after you. And they, and they would tell you, you beat your wife again, we're going to beat you. And they took care of situations of this nature here uh, in this time period. So then the Vigilantes Committee was a, was a group, of, a group of, of men who would get together to try to solve the problems of the community. It, it be it sexually problems or, or mental problems, or just crime in general, they would take care of it. But they were very important here in this time period. But Dan Hawkins them took care of the situation here. They cut the man open, they disemboweled him, and that was the end of that. And uh, he had a very painful, agonizing death when they did that to him, okay? So guys, these folks come splintering in here, taking away people's land, invading the territories of the Indians. This is true in Alabama, Mississippi, and also in Ohio and in Indiana and Michigan. Here comes an Indian chief out of Ohio whose name is Tatomshka. He has plans to build a pan-Indian nation they will run from the Gulf Coast to the Great Lakes. This pan-Indian nation would be a sovereign nation within the United States. John Marshall is gonna rule eventually that, that these Indian folks do have the right to their own nations, and he called them sovereign nations within the United States, okay? Jo uh, the, the Cherokees did this in the, in the 1820 time period. And John Marshall ruled for the Cherokees when Georgia decided to sue them. Because in Forsyth County, the white folks had found gold and the Indian folks lived on it. They didn't, well, they didn't like it. So the people in Georgia filed suit against the Cherokees to get them moved out of the territory. Supreme Court said no, that this was their territory, this was their land. So John Marshall was, a very, a bit, was very vocal in how he thought about Indian folks, that they were American citizens, most of these folks were only like one eighth, one sixteenth Indian, as far as as far as Finnish was concerned. Remember that one drop of Indian blood made you an Indian during this time period. One drop of, of African blood made you an African during this time period. Okay, so guys, John Marshall is trying to find a way to bring some equality to the United States here through the Supreme Court to allow these people to, to maintain and keep their land here uh, in the future. All right. So guys, what's going on here is that Tatomska is very upset because people are invading his territory. They're creating all kinds of crimes. They're killing off Indian families. They're stealing Indian farms. There's a mess out here. Now, this young man is not stupid. This young man has decided that he's going to learn all he can about the white folks. Now, Tatumps is only about 30 years old, 35 years old at most. And he realized, in order to understand the white man, I must understand the Bible. To understand the Bible, he hired a school teacher. Her name was Rebecca Galloway. Rebecca had him read the Bible numerous times and discuss biblical prophecy and biblical law. And then she taught him world history. He learned about the Greeks, the Romans, the Israelis, the Egyptians, the European wars. All these wars he learned about. He is a historical expert, guys. And he figures that now is the last chance that the Native Americans have of creating a nation to stop the American entourage, to stop the American invasion, if you will. You gotta stop it now or never. And here in 1811, all these highways being built across the country and people come flooding in on these highways, he starts a revival meeting. He starts a religious gathering here for Indian folks, if you will. You see in 1800, we had another great awakening take place. This awakening took place in uh, Kentucky. It's called the Cane Ridge Revivals. And in these revivals, the South was burned over again with Christianity. The Cane Ridge revivals of the early 1800s 
is what's going to make America South, the American South, the Bible Belt. We become the Bible Belt with the Cane Ridge Revivals. So Tomska had heard these revival preachers. He started preaching like a Baptist minister or a Methodist minister. And he started traveling across, he started traveling across the middle part of the country to, pe to preach an Indian revival. He says, now time for the Indians to displace and get rid of the white folks. He wants to start a war against them. Another holy war. Well, in October 1811, Tatumska comes to Alabama. He comes down to Old Fort Toulouse, the old French fort here on the Alabama River. In this meeting were David Tate, William Weatherford, Benjamin Hawkins. Okay. Also were some Red Stick Creek Indians, and their leader was named High Head Jim. I had Jim had a little friend with him, and his name was Francis. Whenever you saw Francis, you saw High Head Jim. Okay? Let's go from Dodge and Air Force now and make all the noise in here. In late October 1811, Tatomska is in Alabama. And Tate, Weatherford, Hawkins, High Head Jim, several dozen major Indian leaders. Of the region were here. And to Tomska told them it is now time for a holy war against the Americans. And he just had a, a little a nice little talk going on to about 10 o'clock in the evening. At 10 o'clock, Ben Hawkins, the Indian agent, got tired of all of this. And Ben decided to go back to his camp. His captain on the on the, on the Coosta River, rode up there about four miles, and went to bed. In David Tate's journal, he discusses how when Mr. Hawkins left, that the Tomsky went really berserk, really in high detail about this holy war. Now they're going to fight it. He told the Creek Indians that he'd gone to Pensacola to the Spanish to get their weapons from the Spanish. Get those brand new Spanish muskets, the cannons, the whole nine yards to make war against the Americans. Okay? He also goes up our consulman tells them, when the time for war is it near, and you should start gathering up all of your supplies for this war, I will stomp my foot and the earth will shake. When I stomp my first foot, the, shirt, the earth will shake, and it's time for you guys to gather up your war supplies. When the time that war will come, the stars will fall from the heavens. There'll be big meteor showers, okay? The next morning he gets up, he leaves. He heads up north. When he gets back up north, an American army is waiting for him at a place called Tippecanoe. Tippecanoe was gonna be the capital city of this new Pan-Indian nation. The leader who comes in here to to destroy, to, to, to destroy Tippecanoe and destroy Tatumska is going to be the territorial governor of Indiana, whose name is William Henry Harrison. I want to tell you guys something. If you read about the military career of Andrew Jackson, read about Harrison also. These two men are just as bloodthirsty as the other one is. They do all kinds of, of, of havoc against these Indian people. And it's some of the most horrendous war crimes in American history took care took, was took place by these two future presidents. They were mass murderers, and they had no regard toward Indian life. And Harrison comes in here to canoe, and he destroys Indian children, and Indian women. He destroys the city. He makes war against Tatumsha. He makes war against Tatumsha. The Tomsky and his men are going to escape. They're going to, they're going to go and re regroup here and try to strike back. Their big battle will take place in Michigan in March of, of 1814. And this big battle up here in Michigan is where Tatomska is defeated and is killed. 
And Mr. Harrison puts down this ending revolt up here in this time period, okay? When Tatumska leaves, William Weatherford, David Tate, and several dozen other men who are owners of plantations, they're also uh, uh, just part Indian. William Weatherford's only like one quarter Native American. Uh, his mother, Sahoy, was part French and part British, part English. His dad was, his, 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 his grandpa was English and his dad is English. So, you know, these guys were not very much really Indian. They were more, they were more white folks. They were Indian folks. They were really true Americans when it boils down to. And David Tate and William Weatherford are going to tell these other Indian folks, we cannot make war here in the Southeast. If we make war here against these farmers coming in from Georgia, they're going to send the American army in here. They're going to defeat us. And we'll have nothing left. We won't even have our lives left. They will destroy us, and there'll be no way to get out of this. We cannot do this. We cannot do this work. I had Jim and the Prophet Francis, however, thought otherwise. They were Red Stick Indians, Creek Indians, and they believed that war was the answer. So their group over in West Alabama was totally determined for war where the guys here in South Alabama and Eastern Alabama were against the war. Stay out of it. Don't get involved with the Tomsky, get us all killed is what the, what the attitude was here for these Native Americans in this time period. Okay, well guys, the 16th day of December, 1811, we have the worst earthquake in North America. This earthquake took place about 60 miles north of Memphis, Tennessee. The center of the earthquake was at Cape Girardeau, Missouri. In Ohio, Mississippi rivers come together and form the form into the Mississippi River system. This earthquake was off the Richter scale. This earthquake took place in the early morning of December the 16th, 1811. The church bells in Boston rang for 12 minutes. It rung the bells in Boston for 12 minutes. A tsunami comes off the coast at Destin, Mobile, and New Orleans and makes its way across the Gulf. It goes across the Yucatan Peninsula, it goes across Cuba. When the Mayan calendar ended in 2012, I thought, oh boy, here it comes. Here comes the great earthquake. And it's going to go across, across the Mayan civilization. Thank God that didn't happen. All right. The first steamboat going from Cincinnati, Ohio, down to New Orleans was in the convergence of the rivers when the earthquake struck. The captain on board that steamboat said the river went to a whirlpool for 24 minutes. 24 minutes they were in a whirlpool. And then he said the, the river flowed backwards for 24 hours. This river puts 4 billion gallons of water a day into the Gulf and it flew backwards. It flowed backwards. All kinds of crevasses opened up in, in Kentucky and Missouri. A lot of your lakes in, in Kentucky were formed by this earthquake. And they filled pretty readily. People drowned in their homes from this earthquake. Davy Crockett was down in the Memphis area hunting bear. He already killed about 20 bear when the earthquake had happened, and he killed 40 more after the earthquake. He had a lot of bear hides to take home with him, a lot of bear meat to eat, all right? And in the earthquake, big fissures opened in the ground around him. He almost fell in one of them, but he lost his musket. And he said, I never heard it hit the bottom. This major earthquake is north of Memphis. It's called the New Madrid earthquake. The earth, the fault line runs under Haiti, Cuba, Northwest Florida, Southwest Alabama, on through Northeast Mississippi, right into Tennessee and Missouri, and right on up <coughs> to Alaska. In 1964, we had an earthquake at Anchorage off of this fault line. The city of Anchorage dropped 12 inches. 
for this earthquake. Haiti had a big earthquake several years ago on this same fault line. The other evening, this is this is this is this September of, of 2020. The other evening, we had an earthquake that took place just below Monroeville, Alabama, on this fault line. It's a 3.5 earthquake. So we're due back on this earthquake at any time. And when this earthquake happens this time, you can ride off Shreveport, Monroe, Jackson, Meridian, Tuscumbia, Tupelo, Memphis, Nashville, Jackson, uh, Alabama, I mean, Jackson, Tennessee. You can ride off Little Rock, St. Louis, Kansas City, Chicago, the Tri-Cities up, up, in, up in Illinois. You can ride off Indianapolis and Columbus and Cincinnati and Louisville and Detroit. You'll go into the Canadian provinces, guys. Some folks believe the aquifer under the Great Plains will be exposed when the Great Plain collapses into it. And there'll be a big lake form or a big, another great lake form between St. Louis, Missouri and Denver, Colorado. Only 400 feet down to that big, huge aquifer up under the Great Plains. So it gives you an idea what's going on here, guys. This could be a major, major earthquake, worse than a pandemic. And who will save the American people when it happens? Who will save the American people when it happens? Okay. I had you in the Prophet Francis in 1812. So we have regular trips to Pensacola to pick up war supplies. Spain does not sell them very many at a time because they remember Aaron Burr and his foolishness. Here in early 1813, they came down for a supply run. I hit him the prophet, the prophet Francis. Made their way back up through Escambia County, Florida, on up toward Atmore into Bruton. And north of Bruton, they're going to come to a place that is called Murder Creek. Murder Creek has a little stream that runs into it that is called Burnt Corn Creek. It's a little place up here called Burnt Corn on the old federal road. And here at Burnt Corn Creek, there'll be a skirmish between the Americans and between the Indians who have these war supplies. So your first major encounter between the Creek Indians and the Americans will take place here, guys, at Burnt Corn Creek in early 1813. A few weeks later, we have the largest meteor shower in the history of Alabama. The old timers would tell their grandkids, the stars fell on Alabama. That is one of the state mottos, guys. The stars fell on Alabama. Okay. So here you have a major situation taking place here in the Southeast. Well, in early August, 1813, William Weatherford, who is the nephew of Alexander McGillory, and everybody looked up to him as probably being the new leader of the Creek Indian Nation, a job he did not want. And he totally told him he didn't want to become the head of the Creek Indian Nation. He wanted to be an independent farmer, do what he wants to do, not to worry about somebody else's business. But William Weatherford, who was called the Red Eagle by the Indian folks, and Billy by the white folks, he lived in two worlds here, guys. He decided to leave Caney and the children on the plantation at Little River and go down to Pensacola to buy supplies for the harvest. Get some new saws, some new axes, some new plows, that sort of thing. He carries his truck wagon off down to Pensacola, Florida, and he goes in to buy supplies. This is toward the middle part of this, is toward the 10th so of August, 1813. I had Jim and the Prophet Francis had come to, to William Weatherford several times to ask him to join them as the leader of their big army in this war against the Americans. And he told them, no, I will not go and do it. I will not do it. You're going to get us all killed. You're going to lose your land because of it. And here he gets to the Plompton's Cola, and he heads back home. 
just before he entered his property, here come David Tate, his half-brother. And David Tate says, William, High Head Jim and the Prophet Francis have come in here. They have captured your wife, Caney, and they have captured your three little children. He had two little girls and a little boy. The little boy's name was Major. He was three years old. They carried Caney and the three kids to an island in the Tensaw River. Now you guys go to Google Earth and look at the Tensaw River. Y'all get up there and y'all go in by map and then you get down on the satellite and you go into and look down the, look down the land level, level if you can. The Tensaw River is pretty treacherous. It is a very big swamp. My brother Stan used to live in Fairhope. He had a, he had a bass boat. And we went to the Causeway one afternoon and led our boat into the into the into the Mobile Bay, and we went up the Tensaw River. You can't teach it unless you see it, guys. You got to be able to see this place. And I want to tell you, I saw some of the biggest cotton mouths I've ever seen in my whole life. They're as big as your arm. I saw lots of alligators up here. We went up there on the rat trestle was going across the Tensaw River with the big derailment took place after Hurricane Ivy. But folks, been people, but people on, on the train going across from going into northwest Florida were killed in this derailment here on the bridges. A barge had knocked off the bridges. They were not set up straight on the rails. And the and the and the train hit those those mist lined rails and went off into the into this big huge swamp. Went under that bridge, went on up for that island. Where they held William, where they held Caney and the kids. I want to tell you something. I would have dare got out of that boat. There is just no way. That's the swampiest, most treacherous place I've been to in my life. Okay. David Tate told William Weatherford, several of us guys have gotten together and gone in there trying to get your wife and your kids. But he's but high head Jim's got close to 500. Indian braids in that swamp, and we cannot get to them. There's just no way. And David Tates tells William Weatherford, they want you to join up and be their leader. And if you will, they release your wife and your kids. So they put William Weatherford in a really, between a rock and a hard place. And he started thinking. These guys want to battle one of these big forts we have down here. And they built forts down here because they're worried about Indian uprisings. They built Fort Claiborne. They built Fort, Fort St. Stephen's. You had Fort Stoddard. You had lots of forts. But the newest fort was called Fort Mims. Fort Mims was built just northwest of Baymanette, Alabama, on the Tensaw River. I can take you there, you guys there and be there within an hour and a half, two hours there, easy. And here at Fort Mims, they built it. They built this big five-acre fort. And here they built this thing. They went through and they dug a ditch that covered five acres, a five-acre circle of a ditch. This ditch was dug to be eight foot deep. Okay. They left the sand work right there next to the ditch. They went to the woods and they cut down pine trees that were about eight inches round, or I should say eight inches across our foot across at the most. And they drug those, those, those trees, those cut down logs by mules to those holes. They put the edge of that, of the edge of that, of that um, trunk of that tree into the side, under the edge of the hole. And then the men began to lift it with a mule being hitched to the top of the, top of the, of the pole, top of the pole. So the mule pulled it from the top as the men pushed it into the hole. And once they got all leveled up, they put the dirt around it. And they brought the next tree and the next tree and the next tree and the next tree. On the inside, they took planks they had cut and made scaffolding to hold up the fort so it would not cave in either way, either side. All right. So they put the dirt around it, it's an eight, eight foot of dirt. Around the around the bottom, so it's eight foot in the hole, which is pretty good, pretty good depth, about twenty feet to the top. So you have a you have a post that is close to thirty feet long, is what it boils down to. And sometimes you can cut down one tree and get two posts out of it. Okay, or sometimes you can get three posts out of it. 
And so they built this fort using, using this technology of the poles, all right, and the scaffolding on the inside, okay? On the top, they put a point on the actual, on the actual post, make it hard to get across, okay? And remember, these are pine trees, they're gonna be full of sap. They're gonna be, it's gonna be all sticky and all ooky trying to get at these posts, all right? On the ground level, about four feet above the ground, they put a notch between your pine trees. So about every four or five pine trees, they put a notch between between the pine logs. Okay, this notch was built so you put a you put a you put a musket through there and shoot out of it. It's like a gunship. On the top scaffolding, they left about five feet above the scaffolding, so a man could stand up there and fire from the top and not be hit. Okay, so these are true fortresses out here. It covers five acres. In the middle, they put several buildings, administrative building, they had a smokehouse, had a kitchen in here, the whole nine yards. Lots of picnic tables, you know, the whole nine yards. You can find a picture of Fort Mims on the internet. Just go to Google, type in Fort Mims, and it says show you a map of what it looked like here in Alabama. Okay, I think I got some pictures on my Facebook page of Fort Mims. I know I got a fort on there, how they used to build the forts anyways. So that's on there too. Okay. Then they built two huge gates. The gates were so heavy, it took three men to close the gates. Three on this side, three on that side. And then they put special hooks on the inside in which they put four large boards in, like four by fours. And they went the whole length of the gates on the inside. They had a hook on, 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 on the post on this side and on the gates themselves. And when that fort was fortified, nobody could get in it. The most fortified fort in Alabama. In Indian folklore, if you come to a battle that you cannot win, you leave. You call the battle off. And you go back home for another day. William Weatherford has this plan in mind. I will go through and take High Head Jim's braids. By this time, they're close to 800 of them. And I will take these braids and I'll take them to Fort Mims. And David, while I'm going down to Fort Mims to take care of this attack on this fort we cannot win, I'm going to send you and your friends up to Rendezvous, Caney, and the kids. And when I get back home, have my wagon ready and have my buggies ready because we're leaving. We're evacuating. We're going up to our Purdue Hill, make our way up to our Camden, Alabama, and head up toward a place that is now called Selma. I don't know if you guys ever driven between Bay Manette, which I doubt you have done, you know where Bay Manette is. If you drive from Bay Manette to Fresco City, that road is just like a roller coaster. It is all hills. And you get off one hill, you go into another hill, into another hill. It's like a roller coaster. Just just big, huge waves down that road. I, you almost get sick, and you even driving the car, you almost get sick on that road. If you're going 70 miles an hour, you will get sick. You got to go on like 40 to keep yourself in, in, from throwing up on that road. You go to Purdue Hill, and then from Purdue Hill, you follow the river up to Camden. And I want to tell you, it's like going into the mountains up here. It's really hilly, it's beautiful up here, and it's called the Holy Ground, a place of worship. A place of worship. I'd love to get you folks on a field trip going to Monroe County, going to Monroeville, go to the courthouse to see where Killer Luckenberg was was written and filmed, and then go on up to to old uh, the old um, first capital up here uh, in Alabama, and then going up to to to, uh, to Selma, make our way down through Montgomery, and come back home. It'd be a good weekend trip to do that. To go see all this territory up through here. Here, uh, Catawba was the first capital of Alabama, and it's up here. And uh, it's really a neat place to go to, to see all this stuff. Love going into North North uh, Monroe County, where it's all hilly. You had a sports car, you could tear the roads up up through there. They're, they're hair, hairpin curves. It's like going to the mountains. It remind me a lot of the Blue Ridge Parkway in places. Okay, so guys, he says, I'm gonna hit my family and go up here and hide out. Well, guys, a new commander had come to Fort Mims. He arrived in early August. 
His name was David Beasley. Major David Beasley from New Orleans. And he brought his rum with him. He had three big barrels of rum. And he was very lax in how he conducted himself at Fort Mims. Aren't y'all ready for this one? On the 25th day, or 24th day of August, a hurricane comes right into Baldwin County. And it stalls out. It's a slow-moving hurricane. And during this five-day hurricane, Captain B, uh, Major Beasley kept the gates open at Fort Mims. And all that white sand from along the beach on Kinsaw River washed in and had the gates sealed open. There was no way to close these gates. It would take four or five men with shovels for several hours just to get them so they could be, be closed. And here they're wide open. William Weatherford decided to choose the day after the hurricane had departed to attack Fort Mills. It's August the 30th. And August, on August the 30th at high noon, William Weatherford ride, riding his horse, Hera, and some 500 braves come riding into Fort Mims, and the gates are wide open. They're wide open. William Weatherford realized he's messed up. He never would have believed that these gates would be opened. And these braves fled in, in here. They started attacking these people. They raped the women. They cut throats of women. They mutilated women. They mutilated slaves that were in here. They scalped the white men that were in here. One of the bloodiest battles of the Southeast took place here at Fort Mims, 120 miles from here, guys. Local history. William Weather turned his horse and ran, and ran away. He rode back to his farm, got on his buggies, got on his wagons, got all together. They headed out made their way up toward the Selma area on the Alabama River in the Holy Land, Holy Ground. In the group of attackers at Fort Mills was a young Indian boy named Sonota. Vasi and Zechariah McGrath had not seen him for several months. He's now about 15 years old. And I hope that nothing bad happened to him. When the Indians came flooding into the into Fort Mims, Sonota was in the, in the middle of them. And he goes toward the back of the fort where he runs right into his stepmama and his three little sisters. And Sonota tells Vicey McGrath and the three girls to lay down on the ground and do not move, pretend that you're dead. Sonota laid across them. There were a few of the survivors of Fort Mims. They said the day after Fort Mims, the buzzards were so thick, it looked like midnight over Fort Mims. Early the next morning, around one o'clock in the morning, after the attacks have all been finished and the Indians have all left, Sonota gets his stepmama and those three girls off the floor and they walk through dead bodies. They walk the mutilation and make their way to Tensaw River. And on the river, Sonota finds a dugout canoe. He flips it over, it is water sealed, it will not sink. He finds a paddle, puts the ladies on board that boat, and off they go across the Tensaw River. They go down the Tensaw River and make their way into Mobile Bay. And he rows along where the causeway is today, where the bayway is today and made his way right into Mobile Harbor, here on the Mobile River, about where the cruise ship line is today. And here they find McGrath, Zechariah, in total agony. He's pulling the hair out of his head. He is mournful, he is weep he's weeping because he believes that his wife and his children are dead. 
and he sees this canoe coming. He gets closer and closer and closer. He makes out five people in that canoe. And then he makes out a, a, a young boy rowing. He realizes it's ladies on board the canoe. The boat got closer. He saw his wife and his daughters. He saw Sinoda. The man goes from mourning to jumping and dancing with joy. And he hugs his wife and his children. And he grabs a hold of Sinoda. And as he's hugging him, he says, boy, God put you there to save my wife and my children. And I'm forever indebted to you. What is mine is yours. I'll make you my son. I'll give you a complete inheritance. And you can live the wife of a white man. Sinoda says, no, thank you. These are my people. We're being molested, we're being destroyed, and I must do anything I can to help my people. Sonoda reboarded that canoe and across Mobile Bay. They never saw him again. They never saw him again. Word goes to President Monroe, I'm sorry, to President Madison. Word goes to President Madison that a bunch of Americans have been, have been destroyed, have been killed at Fort Mills. He does not know that this is, a, this is actually a civil war within the Creek Indian nation. But this has nothing to do with the war they're fighting against England during this time period. President Madison is going to send a letter down to Nashville, Tennessee to General Andrew Jackson. General Jackson is in charge of a volunteer army out of Tennessee. They call themselves the Tennessee Volunteers. These boys have spent over eight months down in Natchez waiting for the British to show up to attack the United States from the West during the War of 1812. The British never showed up. So Jackson's army was, was ordered back to Nashville, Tennessee. They arrived back in early 1813. Just a few months before Fort Mims took place. And President Madison orders him and his army to go southward to defeat the Creek Indians, put them in their place. At the same time, President Madison is going to send word to John Floyd, a general out of Georgia, and to General Claiborne, a general out of Natchez. General Claiborne takes place, take, takes care of Mississippi all the volunteers, the militia of Mississippi. They're based out of Natchez. He puts together several thousand young men and they make their way from Natchez along the Three Notch Road into Creek Indian Territory. They're heading into the Holy Land. John Floyd puts together soldiers from North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And they march down the Federal Road out of Augusta down to about where, where, where Auburn, Alabama is today. Okay. And then here comes Andrew Jackson. He is marching across land that has no roads. There's some Indian paths, but there's no major highways like the Federal Road is or the Three Notch Road is. So every 20 or 25 miles, they must stop and build a new supply fort to run supplies in from Nashville, Tennessee into Alabama. From Chattanooga, they'll make their way and build a fort at a place called Decatur. Then from Decatur, they'll build another fort down toward what is now, now known as Gaston. They'll build a fort at Gaston, they'll build a fort at, at, uh, at Anniston, and make their way down into the, western, the eastern side of Alabama. The first major town they come to, of the Indian nation, is Tallahatchie. Delachi has no idea about what's going on over in Southwest Alabama. They have no clue of Fort Mims or any of that information from down there. They had nothing to do with it. They're innocents of the crime. Jackson walks in there and he killed over 500 people in revenge for Fort Mims. He kills Indian children, adults, women, the whole nine yards. 
it is so bloody at here at Tulachi that one of his soldiers leads a group of soldiers to mutiny against Jackson to tell them they're not going to fight a war of this nature. They go through and just murder people for no reason. And Jackson tells them, if you leave, I will have y'all shot down as deserters. The leader's name is Davy Crockett. He knew that Andrew Jackson had some major mental issues. And he was very vengeful toward the Indian folks. When you're taught racism as a child, this is what happens. His mother hated Indian folks, and he believed her, and he's going to do what his mama had told him to do. This was really strange. At Tulachi, General Jackson walks the battlefield, inspects all those Indian folks. Most of these people are, don't have much clothing on. So I'm pretty sure he's a pedophile at heart, too. And he's out here looking at all these folks laying out here, dead in the battlefields, and he comes to a young couple. He appears to be 19. She's appeared to be about 17. And laying between them are a little boy, a little Indian boy, their baby. He might be a year old. And Jackson is going to reach down and grab this child. Looks the baby over. He's a nice, strong, healthy baby. And he calls over two of his officers. And he says the following. My wife and I could not have children. And I want you to take this little Indian baby and give him to her as her adopted son. And let us raise him as our own child. And they carry this little Indian boy back to Nashville, Tennessee, to the Hermitage. And Rachel Jackson received her new baby boy. He had murdered her par his parents in order to get this baby boy. And Rachel does take care of this baby. She loves him. She takes care of him until age 14. At age 14, this little boy dies of scarlet fever. And Rachel and Jackson grieved immensely over the death of this baby. The strange life of Andrew Jackson. Then Jackson is going to march on down to Talladega with the people who called themselves the Natchez at one time, who fled from the French and came over here for safety, will meet the army of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson destroys the city of Talladega and all the folks therein. By this time, General, G General Floyd knows where Jackson is. He heads up toward Jackson. General Claiborne has come into the holy ground, and here he encounters William Weatherford. William Weatherford is a wanted man because he's a man guilty behind Fort Mills, a victim of circumstance. And General Claiborne's army goes after Red Eagle, William Weatherford. William Weatherford got his horse, Era, through the lineage of his father's horses. Uh, Mar uh, Richard, I mean, not Richard, but Charles Weatherford was, well, was a well-known horseman up here in this territory. He brought in the first Arabian stallions in Alabama. He breeded horses. And so William got the first choice of a colt here from his father's farm. And he brought this little horse home with him, this little pony home with him, and he treated him like a dog. They said that that little pony would get on his front porch and lay down and put his paws up and put, put, his, put his hooves up in his lap like a dog would and be petted. The, boy, the man and the, and the horse were as one. And up here on these bluffs above the Alabama River on the eastern side of the river, William Wetford got cornered by the Americans, by General Claiborne's army. And he knew the only way out was to go off the cliff. And he got his horse circled up over and started running and leaped off a 75-foot cliff into the river. When he hit the water, he remained on the horse. And the horse and the man came out together. Weatherford got off the horse on the other side of the river. 
The musket shots could not reach him that far away, and they had sent volleys after him going down into the river. Weather got off the horse, he took the saddle off the horse, took the saddle blanket off, rubbed his hand over air, make sure there's no bullet wounds or any kind of injuries on his horse. Horse was just fine. He put the blanket back on the horse, resaddled the horse, and turned and gestured toward the Americans. I wonder what he gestured. <laughs> He rode off. He rode off. General Claiborne had missed his attempt to capture or to assassinate William Weatherford. General Claiborne rode, rode on westward, met up with General, with General Jackson just north of the Tallapoosa River. On the Tallapoosa River, you had three fronts. You had the Jackson front down the middle, you had the, the Floyd front on the on the left-hand side, and you had the Claiborne front on the right-hand side. The Tallapoosa River goes into a horseshoe down here below Talladega, just north of, of, uh, of, of Auburn. And here the Indian folks had come for protection. They knew that Jackson was a blood, was, was gonna kill them all, that he was a slaughter of people. And they came into this horseshoe, a natural horseshoe on the Tallapoosa River. And across this horseshoe, they're going to put a fencing network that make it almost impossible for the, for the Americans to attack them from the north. They'll be totally safe in this horseshoe. If you guys go to the Facebook page for American History One, you will see the pictures I made at Horseshoe Bend. Okay? Well, Jackson tried several times, the Alabama. Mississippi and, and Georgia boys all tried to go through this, this fencing. It did not work. Finally, one new, young lieutenant got up there and said, boys, here's how you do it. And he got up on that wall and started shooting across, and he got hit with three arrows and two gunshots. And he come falling off that wall, and they thought he was dead. They pulled him to the side where the young man recovered over several weeks. And his name is Samuel Houston. Sam Houston and David Crockett were at Horseshoe Bend. Okay. Well, after several hours of trying to get across this battle, and they couldn't do it, Jackson took his Indian allies, his Cherokee and his Choctaw Indian allies, and told them to cross over the Tallapoosa River and get in behind the Creek Indians. Bring your boats, bring your boats across, like your canoes across that river and attack from the rear. And when they did this, the bloodletting started. Over a thousand people were here at Horseshoe Bend for protection, mostly women and children. They said the Tallapoosa River ran red with blood for several days after the battle here. Indian women tried to swim across the river with their children on their backs, and they gunned them down in the river. They had no regard for the people here. And in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, a little 15-year-old boy died. His name was Sonoka. Jackson took great pleasure in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. I went up there several years ago to their 200 and 203rd anniversary. I was totally disgusted. There is no monument. There is nothing for the Native Americans who were slaughtered up here. It's all the white man stuff. And I'm like, what the heck is going on up here? Where are the, where are the monuments to the people who died up here? Where's a monument for the leaders here that died up here among these Indian folks? What are y'all thinking? It's dedicated to the United States. Calories to the volunteers out of Tennessee. I want to tell you guys something. On a, on a Saturday morning or a Saturday evening or afternoon, when the Tennessee volunteers come to play football in Auburn, the Creek Indian War starts all over again. A lot of the boys at Auburn who play football have the Indian ancestry of the Creek Indians who died up here about 35 miles northwest of Auburn. Those Tennessee boys are descendants of the volunteers that came in here in the Creek Indian War. 
from here in the 2000s, they're, val they're valuing it out. They're having battles against each other and another Creek Indian war called football. Do y'all know our war in America has gone through sports? The Civil War was our last big war because we started playing sports. Right behind Civil War comes baseball and basketball and football and soccer and golf and tennis. It all changed after the war, guys. We started putting our warring efforts into our sports. And we still have fights break out. These ball games, it still does get crazy. But it's part of our heritage. It's part of our history. I want to ask you something. How are today's politicians going to rewrite the Creek Indian War? How are they going to rewrite it? I'm interested in seeing what they're going to come up with. They're probably going to totally ignore it. Don't even put it in the history at all. Okay. Well, guys, after several days at Horseshoe Bend, General Jackson and his armies that are left over are going to go over to Fort Toulouse. And that Fort Toulouse is going to build an earthen fort that is called Fort Jackson. And at Fort Jackson, he says, I want all the people responsible for this war to come see me. He says, I am going to have a court against all these Indian leaders, and they will be executed for causing this war. And the top men on his list was William Weatherford. William Weatherford over here, over here about 80 miles away, gets word that he's wanted by Andrew Jackson. He said, I'm not scared of that guy. I'm gonna go see him and tell him what happened. He got on error and he rode 80 miles all the way to Fort Jackson. About three miles above the fort, a white-tailed deer will jump in front of him and his horse, and he's gonna shoot that white-tailed deer. He kills it. Nice five, but nice eight point buck. And he puts that deer on his saddle, across his saddle, and walks his horse in the three miles to Fort Jackson. The sentry on guard says, what can I do for you, sir? He says, well, I'm here to see Andrew Jackson. I want to thank him for his services here in Alabama and present him with a white tailed deer. Weatherford was dressed in his leather breeches. He had on his leather boots. He had on a white broadcloth shirt and he wore a vest, a, 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 a deer skin vest. He had on a nice hat, which he pulled his hair up under the hat. So he appeared to be a, not be an Indian, but to be a white man. You could tell him from, from an Indian guy because he was, he, he was, he was lighter complected, but he had person, piercing red hair. And he also had big old muscadine eyes, as my grandma would call her. She could pin eyes, big old brown eyes. And he walked into that camp he went to, the jack, went to the tent where Jackson was located. And he pulled back the flap on that tent. And Jackson said, who in the hell are you? And he says, I am Billy Weatherford for my friends. I'm also William Weatherford, but I'm also known as Red Eagle. Sitting at the desk across from Andrew Jackson was John Eaton. John Eaton was Jackson's personal secretary. And John Eaton realize the intensity of this future meeting here. And he took out some clean paper and wrote down everything these two men said to each other in this tent. And I found it. John Eaton in the 1840s wrote a book called The History of Andrew Jackson, including his presidency. And in that book, which I found the university at the state, Florida State University in Tallahassee in their state archives. And I put on white gloves to watch, to read it, to look at it, and there it all was. I had my camera with me, they allowed me to photograph it. And I have the complete conversation between the two men. Oh, they cursed each other, they talked bad to each other for, for a few minutes. And then William Weatherford says, I want to tell you something. My wife, Caney, and my kids were kidnapped by that renegade bunch who caused the whole problem. When he said, my wife, Jackson thought of Rachel, the woman that he dearly loved. And he never told him the complete story. Jackson sat back in his chair, said, John, give me that bottle of liquor. 
me and my good friend here are going to have a drink together. Andrew Jackson put his shoes or put his feet into the shoes of William Weatherford and saw what happened. Andrew Jackson walked around in the shoes of William Weatherford and experienced what he had done and what had taken place. The key here was Caney, his wife. He saw Rachel. These two men talked for several hours. They forged a great friendship, and Jackson said, you know what? William, you're not worth much down here in Alabama right now. People are, people are going to try to kill you. Why don't you take some provisions with you for your wife and your children and for those Indians over there where you're located that are starving? You take a wagon back with you full of all these provisions and feed those folks. Then I want you and Caney and your kids to go to Nashville, Tennessee and live with, and live with Rachel for several months until things cool off down here. And William Weatherford and his wife Caney and their children boarded that boarded a wagon and they went all the way to Nashville, Tennessee. They spent over six months up here. William Weatherford helped to train the horses of Andrew Jackson. When Jackson gets back home from the numerous battles that'll take place in the future, Jackson is well pleased with what William Weatherford had done at his farm. When Florida becomes a territory of the United States in 1821, the first territorial governor in Pensacola is going to be Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson will come up to Little River for several times each year and go hunting with his friend William Weatherford. Whenever Weatherford went down Pensacola to go buy items for his farm, he always stayed with Andrew Jackson and Rachel in Pensacola. In the fall of 1824, William Weatherford and a bunch of his friends went out hunting. They went out in the areas of the they went out in the areas of the of the swamp here along the Tennessee River. One of the guys here killed a white deer, an albino deer. In Indian folklore, if anybody in an Indian hunting party killed a white a white deer who was sacred, somebody is going to die in that group. Three days later, William Weatherford comes down with an illness and he died. He was 44 years of age. Just before he died, he had lost several of his, two of his children, including Major, his youngest son. William Weatherford died. I get these stories from various locations. David Tate's diary discusses this. George Stiggins' diary, his article on the Creek Indian Nation discusses this. Okay. I even found the obituary in the newspaper. In the 1824 Pensacola News Journal, a two-page paper, the front side, the front two pages were done in English. The inside of the paper was done in Spanish. The paper was folded in half. You saw the Amer you saw the English side on the outside, but on the inside was the Spanish edition of the newspaper. And in here, I found the obituary for William Weatherford when he died. I want to tell you guys, you're going to be good historical researchers. If you're going to go to law school and major in history and go to law school or teach history, don't forget the newspapers. The Pensacola, the Pensacola News Journal began in 1819. And the University of West Florida got every copy of that paper on microfilm up through the 1990s. Now it's all digitized. And a lot of those old papers are being digitized now too. And one day you just go to the, to the, to the website and just click it on and there it all is at your house. You're not going to do like I do and drive across the country trying to find libraries to find information. It's going to be at your fingertips on the internet. It's going to make a big difference. I spent thousands of dollars on photocopies. But have copies of these news articles, these journal articles, and so forth about all this rich history here, guys. Without me knowing this rich history from these newspaper articles and from journals, I could not tell you the stories. Okay? Very important stuff here. Okay? Now, during the same time period, the United States is going to declare war on Great Britain. What happens here, guys? 
is that William Henry Harrison, who's fighting, fighting the Shawnee and Tatomska up here in Ohio, up here in Indiana, is going to discover that they have brand new British made weapons. In early 1812, Harrison goes to Washington, D.C. and shows Congress what he has collected here. And they realize the British are not obeying the law. They're still impressing sailors on the high sea. They're still sending cargoes off the American ships. And they're still putting guns in the hands of American Indians. Up here's a new group of senators and House members who call themselves the War Hawks. And they want war against Great Britain. They're tired of it. This includes people like Mr. Henry Clay of Kentucky. We, we, Henry Clay was called the voice of Kentucky, or the voice of the West. Out of South Carolina, you had Mr. John Calhoun. John C. Calhoun was from South Carolina. He's part of the new Warhawk bunch. Your president, President Madison, is a Warhawk. Your vice president, Mr. Clinton, is a Warhawk. Your Southern Democrats are war hawks up here, guys, and they want war against England. The last ones in the American Revolution are now the ones who are calling for war against Great Britain. Now, how crazy is that? The people of New England do not want a war. They said a war with, a war with England would cause us to lose more money and be more disastrous for our economy up here. Their spokesperson is going to be Daniel Webster. He is not a war hawk. He's for peace. He's for peace. Well, we start debating all of this stuff. What to do? And on June the 18th, 1814, I'm sorry, 1812. On June the 18th, 1812, get it right, David. June the 14th, I'm going to be, this is all up. On June the 18th, 1812, the United States declares war on Great Britain. Now, here's what's crazy, guys. On June the 18th, 1812, about four hours earlier in London, they passed a ruling that the Navy could not intercept any more American vessels. They could not steal cargoes nor men. They'll also send orders to Canada to stop the sale of weapons across the border to the American Indians. England is trying to avoid the war on June the 18th. The Americans declare a war on June the 18th. Well, here goes Admiral Perry and his men, and they head up to Lake Erie, and they start building gunboats up here on the shores of Lake Erie. And within several weeks, they're attacking the British in Canada. The war has already started. The American army is trying to go across the northern parts of, of Maine, to, or, or what is now uh, uh, Massachusetts, trying to get to the St. Lawrence River to invade into, uh, uh, into Montreal and Quebec. The Americans are trying to invade through, to, through Detroit to get to Toronto and, and get into uh, Quebec and into York, the capital city of this time period. So the Americans are the first one out here trying to attack. We do not have a large Navy against the British Navy. So President Madison hatches an idea to lease the, the Navy of Portugal to fight for the Americans. That didn't work out too well for us. And so therefore we let pirates be our Navy. The big, the big, the big nest place for pirates is going to be Annapolis and Baltimore, Maryland. And these parts become our Navy. So we're having mostly, mostly little skirmishes across the Canadian border and a few sea battles along the Atlantic coastline. So the war is not really, really aggressing very quickly for one reason. England is trying to fight Napoleon in Europe. And Napoleon is more, is more important to defeat than what's going on in America, the United States. But then we get stupid. In April of 1814, United States Special Forces 
is going to come into the city of Detroit. And here they secretly go across the river here in Detroit into the city of York. And they burn down the city. The entire city of York is destroyed by the American forces. We have destroyed the British capital of Canada. And this really hacks off the British. Parliament is going to order a special forces that's going to come to the Sussex Bay region. They arrive in the, in the early part of August of 1814, August of 1814. This army is being led by Major, Major General Ross. He unloads his boat down at Bladensburg, Maryland. The Americans know that the British have arrived here in Maryland, but they believe they're heading up toward, toward Baltimore, put down the pirates up here that's been attacking the British fleet. There's a large fort up here on the bay, it's on the west side of the bay, that's called Fort McHenry. And Fort McHenry has been totally fortified. The fort has been totally fortified, they're ready for a British onslaught. The head of the War Department is named, is named John Armstrong. And Secretary Armstrong believes the British are not intending to come to Washington, D.C. So the city is left defenseless. President Madison did put together a militia company to go to the, the eastern flank of the Potomac River in case the British should come that way. The president himself is going to put together another militia company that goes into northern Virginia, where he'll be during this time period for several weeks. On the 23rd day, a big skirmish happens between the British and the Americans on the Potomac, on the eastern flank of the river. And here the Americans are nowhere close to matching those soldiers, those special forces soldiers of the British Army. These red coats are special forces they've had experience with Napoleon and Napoleon's armies. The American boys get scared, they turn and they run. One British officer wrote in his diary, they ran like, like sheep being chased by wolves. Over a dozen British boys fell out during this battle from heat stroke. You cannot wear no wool uniforms in Maryland in August and fight a battle. Now these boys died from heat stroke here, heat exhaustion here in this time period. On the morning of August the 24th, 1814, the British Army is going to come into Washington, D.C. By lunchtime, they have marched themselves into the capital of the United States, and here they torch the building. You hush. They torch the building. They come down the mall torching buildings. If the Americans can burn down York, why can't the British burn down Washington, D.C.? Around 3.30, word comes to the White House that everybody must evacuate the White House. Dolly Madison is here. She's the president's wife. And Dolly Madison has had a big banquet for the evening. They're planning a big dinner party here at the White House, or I should say the executive mansion. And she's ordered to leave. She left that she left the table set and the food on the stove, the food on the serving benches and on the buffets and so forth. Before she left, she took the painting of Gilbert out of the frame of George Washington. She rolled it up. She took it with her. He said this, we cannot lose this painting because this is the only one we have of the, of the founding father that is really suitable for the White House. She took it. Across town, a young kid by the name of Pemberton had gone in for the British had arrived and had taken the documents out of the, out of the Capitol building of the Declaration of Independence and the US, in the U.S. Constitution. If he had not done this, we'd never have a copy of, of our great documents. They'd been burned in the fire. Dolly Madison is going to board her buggy and just barely get out of town ahead of the British. They walk in here. They ransack the Capitol. 
They stole the Dolly's love letters. They had been written to her by James Madison, who's about 25 years older than she was. They also stole some of the, the garments and some of the belt buckles and shoe buckles of the president for souvenirs. And they went downstairs and ate the dinner that Dolly had cooked. And then they torched the White House. By the early morning, the White House was nothing but a stone frame. The entire interior of the White House was totally gutted. Nothing left except the stone outside of the White House. Okay. Dolly does make her way to Northern Virginia. After several days, she does meet with her husband. And they're rejoined here. Okay. On the 25th day of August, 1814, the British are still burning the city. They're still burning down houses. They're burning down other buildings and museums and all this kind of stuff. And around 10 o'clock in that morning, they hear thunder rolling in the distance. Around 12 noon, the rain appears. The wind picks up. And the British will find themselves inside of a Category 2 hurricane. A Category 2 hurricane has come over the city and has dumped close to 20 inches of rain onto the capital. And it puts the fires out. During this hurricane, a tornado touches down and hits the, the complete British army. They had cannons that were tall several yards in the distance. They had people who were hurt by the tornado from debris. Around four o'clock, the hurricane moves out and the British Army heads back to Bladensburg, Maryland. They board a ship and they're gone. They said that Providence came over the city and saved it. But they were fighting against God himself. Several weeks later, in the middle, in the early part of September, the British Navy comes back into the region, and this time they head toward Baltimore. And here they're going to set their guns on toward Fort McHenry. Their idea is to destroy this fort, destroy the city of Baltimore and all the pirates who lived here. On one of these British vessels is going to be an American lawyer from Virginia whose name is Francis Scott Key. Francis Scott Key is standing on this British boat because he's trying to get one of his friends freed. His friend is being accused of being a pirate, and he's trying to get him freed from the British court system. And he stood on this boat bow all night long, watching the bombs bursting in air, watching the, watching the artillery being fired off and received coming in from Fort McHenry. And they could not take the fort. The fort stood. And Francis Scott Key is going to write, a, write a, a poem called The Star Spangled Banner. You see, guys, they had the ladies of Baltimore build, make or construct a large flag. This large flag had been sewn into a, in, a, in a big, huge tobacco bar. That's how big the flag was. The flag was sent to Fort McHenry to tell the people of Baltimore if the fort still stood or not. And on that morning after that big nighttime battle, the flag was flying. And they realized that Baltimore was saved. Just like the Revolutionary War, the people of England started hollering and protesting against the War of 1812. Why are we over there again doing something we should not be doing? Our main concern should be the French and Napoleon and not the Americans. Y'all get back home and leave the Americans alone. In early October, the British call for a peace talk in Belgium. The peace talk will take place in Antwerp, Belgium. I'm sorry, in Ghent, Belgium. G-H-E-N-T, in Ghent, Belgium. President Madison is going to send over Mr. John Quincy Adams, who knows everybody, which is a good choice. He's going to send over also Mr. James Monroe. Who's been, who's been a minister for France for a long time. And then he's going to send over Henry Clay from Kentucky. Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams are going to travel together across the Atlantic Ocean. And these two men start planning a new American economy. It'll be called the American system. The American system will involve capitalism. 
and they start planning the roots of how to develop a new economy based on a market revolution. Remember, it takes six weeks over and six weeks back. So they had 12 weeks to discuss all this stuff, but without being interrupted by a whole lot of folks. Okay? So they planned the American system here during this time period. All right? And here in Belgium, they're going to start working on a peace treaty. Okay? Meantime, in November of 1814, the states of New England have become so, so disgruntled toward the American presidents, these Virginia presidents, that they decided for a convention in Hartford. It's called the Hartford Convention in November of 1814. And here, the states of New York, I'm sorry, the states of Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts are going to discuss seceding from the country. Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Vermont have decided that these Virginia presidents are killing the economy of New England. It'd be best for these states to separate themselves from the union. So, guys, secession did not begin in South Carolina in 1832. Secession began here in 1814 when the New England states discussed secession because of the concern over these Virginia presidents and their leadership. Okay? So, y'all remember that. The 24th day of December, 1814. The peace treaty is signed in Belgium. The Treaty of Ghent is signed in Belgium on the 25th, 24th day of December, 1814. Remember the news takes six weeks to arrive back into the country. So in other words, the news won't arrive until John Quincy and Henry Clay and Mr. Monroe come back home. That's what it boils down to, okay? So the war officially ended on the 25th, 24th day of December of 1814. Now here's the other side of the story. Andrew Jackson had left Fort Jackson around the first part of September of 1814 and headed into Spanish Florida. Okay? And here he's going to start fighting against the Native Americans here in Florida. But he also knows these renegade Indian folks have also come off down here. So in, so in the fall of 1813 into the early part of 1814, he's making his way into Spanish Florida. Andrew Jackson invades a foreign country. When he arrives at St. Mark's, Florida, he finds these renegade Indians and he executes them on the spot. The high head him, the prophet Francis, McIntosh, all these guys, he got them down here. They were assassinated by Andrew Jackson. By the way, for our local history, Jackson left Fort Jackson, came down through what is now Montgomery, made his down right way down through Laverne, and on down to on down toward Andalusia. He comes into the border between Spanish Florida and Alabama, where a big, huge lake is located. This lake was caused by a meteorite. We have two lakes that are caused by a meteorite: one at Uniac Springs and one up here in Florella. And here in Florella, he's going to camp out here on Lake Jackson. And then he's going to leave Lake Jackson and walk down to the Round Lake in the Uniac Springs. And then from there, he makes his way down toward Bristol and on down toward St. Mark's, Florida, down below Tallahassee. Then he's going to come back through our area. He's going to come back through northwest Florida to Pensacola. When he arrives here, he meets with the Spanish officials. He tells them, if you cannot control this area, I'm going to run you out of here. And I'll take over Florida. You better get some grip on these local Indians and these people down here. Or it's going to be some bad trouble for you guys. So he goes and he threatens the Spanish down here with war in their capital, Northwest Florida colony. It's crazy. He's totally crazy doing this kind of stuff. And then he says, I need to find out what's going on with the British. And through his little spy network, mostly through pirates along the Gulf Coast, he realizes the British has got a flotilla. The British flotilla is off the coast of Mississippi at Ship Island. 
and he makes plans to get away to get the British toward the city of New Orleans for a big battle. He wants to revenge the death of his family by the British. He soon learns as a pirate in Pensacola, whose name is Jean Lafitte, or Jean Lafitte. Jean Lafitte is down on Palafox Street. In fact, on those hidden alleyways in one of those dark backroom bars. And Jackson and his few of his men walk off down there to Palafox Street. They locate the alley and make their way into where the bar is located. They tell the barkeep, where is that pirate named Jean Lafitte? They said, well, he's back there in that room, right back there. Just go back there and talk to him. He's there. He's waiting. He's no, there's somebody back there with him. He's back there been drinking. You just go and talk to him. Jackson walks in. And the two men become instant friends. The old pirate and the general. And Jackson tells him, I need a Navy. I know the British are heading toward the city of New Orleans. And I know I need a pirate, Fotella, to help me get those British into a special area so I can attack them. You see, guys, down southeast of New Orleans, it's a, it's a little lake called Lake Borg. It goes, into, it goes into the Gulf, just like Prince Train does. It's a freshwater lake. And he says, if I can get you guys to get the, the British Army into that lake, I can fortify along the river and stop them from invading the city of New Orleans. All right, this is early December of 1814. Okay? Remember, the treaty's going to be signed here in a couple of weeks in Belgium. They have no idea it's going to be signed in Belgium. So Gene Lafitte is going to have Andrew Jackson out. He has some 28 ships, and he goes and attacks the British Navy and leads them chase into Lake Borg. In the meantime, Jackson and his men are making their way to the city of New Orleans. And once in New Orleans, they go about three miles down the river to where the river gets really close to Lake Borg. And here they're going to build a moat and put up a barricade. The barricade is very similar to what the Creek Indians had done at Horseshoe Bend. Behind the barricade, they're going to put cotton bales. Musket balls will not go through cotton bales. They had rifles, they'd been in trouble. But cotton, but, but, but cannon, but uh, uh, musket balls won't go through cotton bales. And so they brought in slaves, they brought in free Creoles, they brought free Creoles of color into this area, and they made a fortification between the river and the lake. Now on the eastern, on the west side of this lake, it's real swampy. You can't go through the swamps. There's just no way. But Lafitte, as he promised, just a few days after Jackson them arrived, got the British Navy into Lake Borg. And here the leader of the British Navy, whose name is Admiral Plankingham, decides to put a camp about four miles down the river from where Jackson's fortification is located. It's the location of a plantation. And this plantation makes syrup. Sugarcane plantation. Once they get their encampment set up, Andrew Jackson calls in the teenage boys. I want you boys to go down here and I want you boys to make noise and keep these Brits awake all night. Y'all shall fire off firecrackers and y'all hit pots and pans together. Y'all yell and hoop and holler and so forth. Then make your way back up here to the camp and tell me what you found out while y'all down there playing hide and seek. After several days of this, this is an early January of 1815, Admiral Plinkingham sends a note to Andrew Jackson. If you were, if you were a gentleman, you would let us sleep at night and make all this noise. Jackson wrote back, if you were a gentleman, you would not be here. And I'm sure y'all know he probably used the word your ass in this conversation. All right? Would not be here. So Andrew Jackson is already feuding with, with Admiral Plankingham, who's about four miles down the river. Well, Plankingham gets mad, and he orders in the siege cannons off his boat. They unload those cannons. And they roll them up, up there to be about a, by about a, about a, about a thousand feet from, and from Andrew Jackson's barricade. Okay? 
they decided to put barrels of syrup behind the cannon wheels to keep it from rolling backwards. And they started firing toward Andrew Jackson fortification. And of course, those cannonballs just bounced off. They didn't do anything. But the syrup did something. As those cannons rolled back and that hit those syrup, but those syrup barrels, those barrels broke loose and that syrup got all over those guns and it ruined them. That sticky old syrup got into those fire mechanisms and then into those wicks and it ruined them. The cannons were totally useless. On the eighth day of January, 1815, Plankin County makes his big move. He takes several dozen boys in rowboats and sends them across the river to go across the river to the other side, walk up behind, on the other side, get behind Andrew Jackson's army, then cross over and get them sandwiched in. So they had several, you know, several dozen soldiers on rowboats going across the, across the river to get behind Andrew Jackson. Well, here's the problem. It's January, it rains down here, the river is flooded. Those boys went eight miles down the river for them to get across the river. So they were totally out of commission. He done lost part of his army. He only had like, I think he had like 8,000 men with him here in this time period in this battle. And Jackson only had 2,000 men with him, 2,400 men with him. All right, then, they decided to go on a three front maneuver. The first wave would go up against the swamp. The second wave would go against the river, on the shore of the river. The third wave would go up the middle. And Jackson saw him come. And he put his men into five rows behind that barricade. Don't you picture this. You got a wooden barricade that is close to 500 feet long. There's a molt in front of it. You have all these cotton bales lined up and you got men probably close to 100 men in each line. And you got five lines lined up behind that barricade. And all five lines are loaded, ready to go. And Jackson told his men, stay down until I tell you to get up. When you come up on this front row, you fire into that, into that crowd. When you go back down row two, you come up and you fire. Then you go back down, row three comes up, they fire. They go back down, row four comes up, they fire, row five comes up, and then they fire. If you can't count to five, you're gonna be in trouble. That means you got five volleys going off pretty much instantaneously against the Brits. And by the time row five has fired their shots, row one has already reloaded. And they're ready to go back up again. And when those British soldiers hit that moat, Andrew Jackson says, fire and the whole line goes down then the next line goes down then the next line goes down then the next line goes down those major generals get concerned because their boys are all falling out up here in the front causing a traffic jam and they come riding up there and jackson says get them remember the major generals are the ones who control the soldiers you take them out and the soldiers have nobody to rely upon and all of a sudden, here comes Plankingham riding up to see what's going on with his major generals. And he shot three times. They took out the leadership of the British Army. And the soldiers had nobody to rely upon. And those major generals way back behind, they couldn't do anything. So the 2,400 Americans in this army of Andrew Jackson is going to capture over 8,000 British soldiers. I want to tell you guys something that's very important about this battle here at New Orleans. This is probably the first American war battle that involved all Americans. You had Cherokees, you had some Creeks, you had some Choctaws, you had free men of Florida who were escaped slaves from Georgia who joined Andrew Jackson. So you had the free blacks in here. You had the Creoles of New Orleans, both the white Creoles and the black Creoles, and also enslaved Creoles in this army. Okay, you had boys Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and the Carolinas. So the Battle of New Orleans is one of the most important battles in American history. 
And this battle was fought here, guys, to make sure the British did not invade the city of New Orleans here. But the battle took place three weeks after the Treaty of Ghent. The, the war was fought when the war was over. And Andrew Jackson becomes the American hero of this time period. People start loving Andrew Jackson. He's the big war hero here of the time period, okay? In three weeks time after the battle at New Orleans arrived, this is early February, the news arrives in Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Washington, D.C. that Andrew Jackson had beat the British at New Orleans. At the same time, Monroe, Adams, and Clay arrived from Paris. And the headlines are, we have peace. And a lot of folks believe that Andrew Jackson had single-handedly won the war against England. They believe that Andrew Jackson had single-handedly won the war against England. Now, how crazy is that? So your big war hero is Andrew Jackson. And the American people realize for the first time that we are totally free, that we are totally free, that nobody's going to come back in here and try to take us that we have now built a country that has respect against everybody in the world. England in 1814's treaty has agreed to partner with us in trade and in the military if needed. Our new partners in the world will be the British, okay? So the American people are going to align themselves with Great Britain and they become our great trade partners, okay, at this time period. And in the 20th century, they become our great war partners in the 20th century. Okay, so guys, a lot takes place here, guys, in this time period. I would love to get Steven Spielberg and a bunch of Hollywood producers together and write a history for a movie on the Creek Indian War and the Battle of New Orleans. I'm afraid we could make Indiana Jones look like a big old huge sissy. That he would, he, he, would not, he could not man up to what, what took place down here in the Southeast and these Creek Indian Wars that took place. And Jackson's a major part of the Creek Indian War. And Andrew Jackson makes his name here. Now, Jackson will come back to Florida in 1815, 1816 time period and fight Seminoles. They are raiding across the Florida, the Florida border to Georgia. They're destroying plantations, they're destroying crops, they're also stealing slaves. And Andrew Jackson comes back in for the Seminole Wars. And of course, as I mentioned before, when Florida is finally ceded to the United States by Spain in 1821, the first territorial governor will be Andrew Jackson. So that's where his political lineage comes from. His military is already, is, is already established, and now he has his political established. By the way, when they shot Plankingham down here on the, on the banks of the river, and below New Orleans, Andrew Jackson wanted to give him a good send off because he got his revenge for his family when he shot and killed Plankingham. So he ordered a barrel of rum to come down from New Orleans. The boys opened the barrel up on the end and they took their little tin cups and they all got him a big drink of liquor. When the barrel got half empty, Jackson had the body of Plankingham put into that barrel. And they sealed the barrel up. They pickled the emerald. They sent the body back to the ship in Lake Borg where his wife and children were located. And somewhere in the somewhere in the Gulf, down below New Orleans, there's a pickle barrel, a barrel full of rum with an admiral laying in it, floating somewhere in the Gulf. I hope it's not there anymore, but it was there for a time. All right. So it kind of concludes the story about Mr. Plankingham and the battle here at New Orleans. So don't you guys to understand what happened here locally in our history. Just like I told you guys before, there's some great local history here that nobody really discusses. They don't really go over it too much uh, in this time period. And Andrew Jackson had made a, paid a major part in Northwest Florida, along with William Weatherford and, and, and uh, David Tate and, uh, and um, Mr. Um, um, oh gosh, what's his name? i remember here in a second here. Mr. Harrison, not, not, not Benjamin Hawkins, all these guys play a major role here in our local history. 
and you guys can read about this stuff on the internet. Y'all just go to Florida Memory, guys, to the Florida State Archives. You can see a lot of this stuff. Go to the Alabama State Archives in Montgomery. You can read all this stuff on the internet. There's some really good things. Go to the Encyclopedias of Alabama and read about this stuff. There's interesting things here to look at. Okay, and that concludes this lecture, and I'll be back here shortly for number nine, or lecture number seven, rather. Okay, all right, guys, see you later. Thanks.